Okay, this is the uh, Tuesday, March 26, 2024 council meeting. And we have a little bit different um, format today because we had a open session from three to four on the zoning code and we went to closed session, so now we're back. So this is the beginning of the, the uh, formal council meeting. So with that, since as we're coming out of closed session, any additions and deletions to the agenda tonight? Yes. There is. Um, I would respectfully request the removal of item 10 from this uh, from the consent calendar uh, in consideration of a letter that the city council received at 233 this afternoon that may have a bearing on what the recommendation and your action would be. And just for those who, who didn't hear what the mayor said, the, the city council met in a study session at 3 p.m., went directly to a closed session at 4 p.m., and uh, would not have had an opportunity to consider the letter that you received at 233. Surely staff has not. And so for that reason, I would respectfully request that the item be removed from the agenda this evening and that it return be and the item be returned to you at a later date. Is, is that because of the substance of the letter or just any letter that would come? This particular, the substance of this particular letter. <clears throat> okay. and, and, and for the benefit of the audience, if you don't have an agenda in hand, that was the consideration of local historic, historic. that was Freudian, the uh, local historic status of 337 Hawthorne Road. The recommendation in print was receive and file a report. I would ask that you not take any action on that matter this evening. Again, we'll return to you very shortly with uh, a related item. Okay, thank you. We don't need a motion or anything. Unless there's objection. No. Okay, as we've come out of closed session, are there any reportable actions out of closed session? Thank you, Madam Mayor. The City Council convened in closed session pursuant to the six items identified on the agenda. Um, there is no reportable action with respect to the matters of existing litigation. Um, with respect to the item number three, with the appointment of an acting city manager, um, the City Council has appointed Gavin Curran, the assistant city manager, to serve as the acting city manager. Um, following the interim city manager's departure uh, this Friday when his, when he turns into a pumpkin. Um, <laughs> and other than that, there is no further reportable action. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Okay. This time we'll open the, open it up for uh, public comment. Anything that's not on the agenda, please come forward. How's it going? I'm uh, Zach Cornwall. I own Wig Sandwich Shop. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't here earlier for the study session. I was totally confused, but I want to make a comment on the comprehensive zoning update. Um, yeah, so it took me three years to open Wigs. About six months of that was build out. Two and a half years of that was government bureaucracies and processes. Um, I think it was 19 months of that was just trying to figure out how to get parking. At one point, they told me I needed 27 parking spaces for an 800 square foot sandwich shop. Uh, we operate with about four and it's great. Sorry, this gets me fired up because it was a huge part of my life. <clears throat> um, yeah, if you come by on a Monday or Tuesday, uh, you'll see at noon, you'll see that we are slammed out the door and uh, our parking lot is empty. So clearly the parking is not a business issue. Um, the hole that I've been put in from having to try to open a business for three years is incredible. I have an extremely successful business, but it's going to take me years to recover just from uh, the three years. Luckily, I had a job remote. I was blessed with that. I have parents that are super uh, supportive, a fiance that's super supportive, a brother, all that good stuff. But there's still a huge hole due to the 20 months it took me just to get parking approved. I encourage you all to really strongly consider changing this, making it better for businesses. And um, please use me as a resource for any research, any questions you have, because it was overly comprehensive. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zach. Hello, I'm Ed Kaufman, a 47 year resident. Of consider changing this, making it better for businesses. And um, 
please use me as a resource for any research, any questions you have, because it was overly. Um, okay. I don't know what happened. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah. I'm a 47 year resident of Laguna Beach, the last 10 of which uh, have been spent in North Laguna. Um, we are greatly impinged upon um, by the police shooting range. It's supposed to be uh, twice a month, and it's, it is uh, scheduled twice a month, and it occurs then. In addition, um, look, in both January and February, there were three additional times that uh, the shooting range was used. We're not against police learning how to shoot, as some people have accused me. I think it is important that they practice. Uh, but the neighborhood has changed uh, since the 40 years that it was first built. Um, there's more residential housing there now. Uh, the Festival of the Arts is increasing their events. Uh, more and more people are using the hiking path. And uh, people are greatly impinged upon by this noise. Um, the decibel sound in a shooting range is about uh, 160 decibels, which is deafening. So I hope that the police used uh, some kind of screens. But that noise comes up uh, the valley, uh, the canyon, quite loud and is uh, very disconcerting to people like us who, uh, who work at home. Um, so there is a solution, of course, to move it and to move it indoors or somewhere else. It was bliss when it moved up to Irvine, but I realized that took travel time. Um, I did a little research and it turns out that there are acoustic solutions. Um, there can be a, a, a roof built that's lined with something called block absorbed sound panels. And there are, can also be the use of side baffles or walls which can also be lined with these baffles. Now, of course, this would cost money and you probably need an acoustic engineer uh, to consult. Uh, but I think it would be a relatively inexpensive uh, solution to what is becoming uh, an increasing problem. Thank you. Adam. <clears throat> Hi, Council. I'm Adam Redding Kaufman here speaking in support of my father who lives at 545 Poplar Street. Imagine you are sitting in your living room. It is 10.03 p.m. on a Tuesday, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 gunshots echoing off your living room walls. You don't know if the source of the gunshots is coming from the shooting range, which is basically in my parents' backyard, or if it's coming from the pageant of the masters, the sawdust festival, or somewhere else in the canyon. So the two main priorities that I wanna to bring to your attention is one, that the shooting range is not always used responsibly, and two, that the shooting range hasn't changed with our town and our society over the years. So the first issue I have is kind of with how it's being used. My parents are given a schedule of when the police department is supposed to be using the range, and it they do not always follow this schedule. There have been times where they have been shooting after 10 p.m. Um, I actually called 911 because I thought that someone else was there or that there was even a shooting happening down in the canyon. And... Um, some of the reasons that my parents have been given also don't make a lot of sense to me. I've been told that they were there um, at 6.30 p.m. July 4th weekend because they needed to recalibrate a weapon. That doesn't really check out with me or any of my friends who own their own guns. And then second, I don't think that this shooting range has really kept up with the town and how the town has changed. We have no signage nothing that indicates that they are down there actively shooting except for their vehicles being parked down there. So when people are hiking up on our county hiking trails, they can't even see the shooting range. They just hear the gunshots. And numerous times I've seen visitors who are using our hiking trails very concerned and alarmed because they just hear gunshots echoing off our canyon walls and they have no clue where they're coming from. So again, like my dad said, 
we're not here to shut down the shooting range. We're not here to shut down our police department. We want to work with them to have changes be made that fit the town and the growing neighborhood up at the top of Poplar Street. So we would support, you know, changing it to indoor or some acoustic changes to help with the noise. And I'll end with emphasizing, it was not disclosed to my parents that the shooting range was there. A lot of people think my parents built a home there knowing a shooting range was there. That was never shared with them. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Hello, hi, I'm Cherie Rady. I'm a resident uh, for the last 20 years of Laguna Beach at 2899 Rounceville, which is at the corner of Hinkle and Rounceville, about a block north of the Montage Hotel. Um, I'm here today because um, I think it's important that, uh, that you know that when I purchased my property 20 years ago, we had a 180 degree view of the ocean. Um, unfortunately, my neighbor at 2855 has decided to build an ADU three feet from my house. When I say three feet, I mean it does not uh, meet the four foot fire fire code. And we have become a uni house or will be if it's built. And so when I say uni house, I mean that you might as well put a door between my house and their house. We are so close. Now, a lot of people think that that the population does not want ADUs. That's incorrect. Uh, what 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 people don't want, like myself, is an ADU that blocks 50 percent of your view. So I'm now went from an 180 degree view to 90, 90 degrees view, which is huge. And it's, and I also have this ADU that's right next to me violates the fire code. So I am concerned about fire uh, and also noise and enjoyment of my property. Um, had there been any discussion or disclosure, um, we would have said, you know, you put it here, you put it there, it'll work out, it'll be fine. In fact, my husband was advised by my next door neighbor uh, we're thinking about putting a very small ADU in. Um, we're going to put it, and he asked where, and he said, I'm going to put it over here. And he, he mentioned the other side of the property and down below. And we're like, oh, could be okay, you know, and then heard nothing else for two years. Then all of a sudden it's built next to my house within three feet and it blocks all my views. I have submitted uh, photos for you to see where you can see the story sticks. Not only can you see the story sticks, but remember there's, this, there's a ceiling, which is another 10 inches above it. If you go 10 inches above it, you'll see that I've lost my ocean view. And I've also had all my windows blocked from the back of my house. And in fact, when the wife came over to look at it, she's like, oh my God, I had no idea it was going to look like this or be this high. I thought it was going to be below your, uh, the level of your, your, first, your second floor. Um, I'd like, okay, so then I'd like to also introduce my son. Yeah, to close, my name is Christopher Rady. I'm Sheree Rady's son, but I'm also a partner with Reed Smith. It's a global law firm in our Orange County office. I'm representing our family on this matter. Um, and for anyone in this room who's been similarly affected or anyone else who is viewing this record um, after the fact, feel free to get in contact with me, last name Rady, R-A-I-D-Y, with Reed Smith. We have an ADU task force and real estate team put together with the goal to meet private agreements with your neighbors outside of litigation. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Council. I'm Tom Osborne, and I'm here to announce uh, what promises to be a very good, exciting Earth Day event coming up on Monday evening, April 22nd, at the Rivian uh, Theater here in Laguna Beach. It's, the event is being sponsored by the Laguna Canyon Conservancy, and the themes 
Uh, actually, there's one overriding theme, which is climate change. But we'll also be looking at the impacts of climate change on our ocean environment. Uh, some of the groups that we'll be presenting will be including the Laguna chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, with which uh, I'm affiliated. Uh, there will be the Laguna Blue Belt and the Laguna Ocean Foundation. Uh, attendees will get a lot of information on these issues and uh, the whole project of uh, estuary restoration here in Laguna Beach. It promises to be a very good event. And it's, it'll be at 5.30 p.m. The doors will open then. Uh, again, at the Rivian Theater on Earth Day, April 22nd. Thank you. Tom, can I have a question? So they, do you need to make a reservation? Yes. You, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Can you get that the video, maybe? Hello. My name is Susanna, and I will play for you, or I would like to play for you, 37 seconds of pickleball being played with quiet paddles at Lang Park. Please play that. Thank you. Technical difficulties again. Yeah. Can we try that again? Uh, just because it's very, very important. Thank you. about the end it it should have played well you, you could hear the sound i believe and i am here again to ask this, the city to close down the pickleball courts at lang park the noise is literally defined in science as a highly impulsive sound source this week i went down there once again forced to be the person who is documenting the harmful noise from this courts i told you at the last meeting that the so-called quiet paddles have not worked I went over to make another recording to show you, and I was yelled at by the coach who waved his fingers and accused me of doing something illegal. This city continues to harm my health and well being. I request that you protect me and my neighbors from the impulsive noise. Pickleball belongs somewhere that does not destroy the lives of nearby neighbors. Thank you and good night. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Mayor Kemp, my name is Gene Felder. I'd like to address the council as the president of the Top of the World Neighborhood Association uh, regarding the Southern California Edison uh, unpermitted grading bulldozing paths in the open space. We appreciate the updates that we have received from uh, city manager Sean Joyce, but we have concerns. In January, the city stopped the unpermitted grading and told us that uh, Edison agreed to use helicopters to replace wires and five utility poles in the open space west of Alta Laguna Boulevard and uh, north of Park Avenue. However, the uh, city manager emailed us on Wednesday, quote, that on Monday, March 18th, Edison returned to work to replace the five utility poles in the open space, unquote. Quote, they said using a helicopter to replace the poles was not viable due to the tall, dense brush surrounding the poles unquote, and that Edison, quote, plans to clear a small buffer area around each pole that will allow future pole maintenance to occur via helicopter, unquote. After the work is complete, SCE has agreed to obtain a full coastal development permit. 
after the work is complete? Is this the way to protect the protected open space? The city uh, manager also emailed this on Thursday that included, quote, planning commission will consider approving the design review and coastal development permit at a noticed public hearing, likely in the summer of 2024, unquote. The summer 2024 planning commission should be important for the restoration of the damage to the top of the world open space, but obviously will be too late to protect or to minimize the damage to the open space. Uh, the city manager and the city engineer also answered uh, town of questions, which included, uh, we asked, did the fire department know about the fire risk of this project? And the answer was, quote, no, unquote. We asked, has, uh, has the erosion control measures been monitored and has the city deemed them effective? And the answer was, quote, the erosion control measures have been minimally effective. We asked some other question, but I can't get the next page. Let's see here. Oh, there it is. Uh, we said, uh, we asked, can the, city can the city fence off or otherwise discourage the public from using the Edison graded paths as new, new trails in the open space? And the answer was, quote, signs could be placed, although they might, may likely be ignored. A concern we have is that fencing may result in additional trails being created outside of the graded ones, unquote. And we asked, we have yet to see a helicopter working. Is that what Edison has agreed to do? And the answer was, uh, quote, use of helicopters is no longer being considered for pole replacement, unquote, unquote. So the town of board would appreciate the city to actively work to minimize the damage to the open space before the work is complete and before the summer planning commission meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Michelle Monda. Yesterday, I became aware of AB 2817, which is a uh, bill that was put forth by Diane Dixon at the request and sponsorship of the city of Laguna to take over Pacific Coast Highway from the north of, of Laguna to the south of Laguna. Now, I have a number of problems with that. The first problem is no resident I know of was aware that you guys were cooking up this plot to buy an additional highway after we are looking now into Laguna Canyon Road. So there was no transparency here. We had no idea. This gobsmacked all of us. Number two, this is pretty important too. There were two city council members, two, who did not know that this had moved forward. That's pretty shocking because I don't know who authorized this. Isn't that supposed to be something the city council agrees to? Number three, at five minutes, uh, five hours and 17 minutes into the planning committee, the planning, the strategic planning meeting you had in uh, January, Bob, at the very end of all of his list of things that he wants to do, it's like a throwaway sentence. Oh, he says, uh, where do we stand on relinquishment of Pacific Coast Highway? There's no discussion. There's no agreement. There's no nothing. One of the staff comes up and says, well, we have this prepared. We're just kind of waiting for direction from the city council. Well, the city manager then says, well, would a nod and a wink suffice? And he says, yeah, a nod and a wink would suffice. Now, is this how we are getting things through city council? A nod and a wink without any resident knowing about it and without specifically letting two uh, city council members know that this is coming down the road? Now, I know Bob, Alex, and Sue, you guys know all about this. Sue, your, your uh, signature is on this letter uh, saying that you're happy to sponsor this. But I also have another question and another problem with this. Do you have any idea where we stand with Laguna Canyon Road right now? I slogged through the 137 pages of the uh, presentation. All I could come up with is on an, uh, on an annual basis, we're going to be spending $11,386,000. That's just annually. But the whole project is going to be $336 million. Now, are you going to tell me right now? that on top of all that that you're asking the residents to foot the bill for, you want to now 
own uh, uh, controls uh, Pacific Coast Highway. I think there needs to be some transparency here. There needs to be some uh, knowledge beforehand uh, to the residents that you guys are even cooking this up because I don't think we have agreed to this. Thank you. Good evening, City Council. Edward Bayak, old resident of Laguna Beach. Um, I is requesting assistance from the city attorney uh, uh, to potentially meet with the OC district attorney as uh, to concerning an old trespassing violation that is connected with my handout. And I have a box for you. Um, a U retired U.S. attorney in New York will confirm I had a trespassing violation at my house early evening, long time ago. The trespasser wasn't bio, uh, wasn't uh, prosecuted. But the, my problem with the trespassing violation and a police report was done that the person who trespassed, the information was deleted from the police file or was not added to the police file. The issue is that the very next morning, I had a federal judge meeting in San Francisco. And the U.S. attorney from New York was at that federal judge meeting. He is aware of the trespassing violation and the person that wasn't prosecuted. That person was connected with uh, an intense litigation that I've been involved with, with concerning my handout to the city attorney. My question is why... In the police report, why was there no, why was the information deleted or was it not added or was it missing? The issue is that the two police officers, one is still working for the Laguna Beach Police Department. The other one was fired, but worse, he no longer can be a police officer. So there is a connection to that meeting as well as the information I'm about to give to the city attorney connects all the dots at uh, Winston Churchill once spoke to the commons and said, you need to kind of learn from history. So you don't repeat the same mistake and you can learn a lot of information from understanding history and understanding your mistakes. And I admit I make tons of mistakes and I regret the mistakes I make. But with that, I just want to hand uh, the box of information to the city attorney. And I had a handout for the city council people. So that goes to the city attorney. And uh, this is a, just a two supplement handout that you can see the trespassing violation and then the attachment. Probably historically, one of the worst trespassing violation that did not get prosecuted and it will put Laguna Beach in the news. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> good evening, City Council. Hope you guys are having a good day. Greg Viviani here, South Laguna Beach resident. I'm speaking today to urge you to look at the facts, the science, and the recent studies that I have presented you all about the Aliso Creek sand berm situation. There should never be a law inhibiting people from speeding up the inevitable when there is no immediate public safety risk when the beach is not crowded. This water will flow and the water flowing keeps bacteria levels low from increasing by stagnant water. This can potentially cause more problems in our marine protected area, not to mention many mosquitoes and a very foul smell that we're all familiar with. Trenching the sand burn by ham is a lot less or a lot more environmentally friendly, which can also sometimes prevent heavy equipment from being needed directly on the sand. This water is going to flow more often during high tides and rainy seasons, but I can't say it enough, when the water sits stagnant for days and weeks at a time, this harmful bacteria increases and will still eventually go into the ocean. So less, but less time between berm knockdowns, the better. The issue is not the sand berm, but upstream. This pollution is coming from all the communities up above. Also, the increased amount of rains and high tides we've been having causes this creek mouth to open more frequently and the majority of the time by itself. Yesterday, and I attended a very important meeting with the Molten Nigel Water District. <clears throat> they presented to me their Oasis Direct Potable Reuse Project, and I was very pleased with what they had to say and show. The project has also been approved 
uh, with funding from FEMA. And I must urge the city, South Coast Water District, Emerald Bay, and Sakwa to get behind this OASIS project and the Molten Nigel Water District as a whole. They also told me that they intend to keep all current staff at locations that they must manage in order for all this to work. This is the first of its kind in Orange County, and hopefully this will set a precedence for other, other coastal communities across the state and country. Wouldn't we want to be all part of something so great in the beginning? This is a common ground all sides should support. Hopefully everyone, everyone will see this and will have and see the benefit this will have for future generations, our environment, uh, with clean, filtered, reusable, sustainable water that we should every human should have a right to. Um, also, a potential great place for the pickleball court problem is the back parking lot at Aliso Beach. I have even provided possible opportunity for funding for this project. And as for the $35,000 CCTV camera, I think it should be focused on the parking lot at Aliso Beach. And since now they will be able to be serving hard alcohol at the Lost Pier, Let's have it pointing that way, since we know that crime usually is around alcohol consumption. So thank you for your help and have a good day. Thanks, Greg. Good evening, all. Uh, happy spring. Uh, Gary Kasich, part of the Sensible Laguna team. Uh, I was unable to attend the uh, last meeting when residents spoke in large numbers regarding the options for the city's aquatic needs. It was heartening to see the level of interest from across the community. What was really interesting is no one spoke in opposition to approving aquatics for the city and the students. It was all about the how. It's clear the majority support a pool targeted to the needs of the broader community rather than the unique requirements of the high school. Multiple surveys now show support for a community pool and opposition to a 50 meter pool at the high school. Even the voices at the last meeting against a community pool were really not opposed but rather express their opinion that a community pool would never get done. So there's little doubt on what the residents feel is the correct course of action. Your 5-0 vote to proceed with plans for a community pool demonstrates there is a good answer for the city and actually for the district. It may not be the easiest, but it's the right decision and you should be congratulated. I was especially encouraged by Mayor Kemp's comments directed to those who spoke to the city's potential inability to get the job done based on past performance. Your comments, we have a can-do council, a lot different than it used to be. I couldn't agree more. So let's stop talking about how hard it will be and how long it will take and let's get started with the heavy lifting. Sure, there's gonna be some hurdles and there'll be some objections, but if you commit to a fast track and dedicate the resources, you can make it happen. We and many residents behind us stand ready to help in any way we can. There are also many voices concerned with the school district's runaway spending plan, including now $19 million for a pool that will support 80 athletes. While it may not be your fight, you're inextricably tied to their actions, as it will impact residents, one, through the loss of access to the pool under the JUA, two, part of the community's tax pocketbook, and three, neighborhood impact. Sensible Laguna will continue to petition the district to be reasonable and balanced in their spending and to coordinate with the city in plans that support students and residents alike. There is a way, with a bit of compromise and coordination on everyone's part, to keep spending in check and to avoid any pool downtime for anyone. At the end of the day, with the city accelerating their plans and the district potentially being delayed in approvals, the projects may only be a year apart. So let's get to work and get things done. Before I step away, Sean Joyce, thank you for your time here. It was a pleasure working with you. Wish you luck in your future. Ready? Hi, uh, Steve Brown uh, is also a sensible Laguna, also a Laguna Beach resident. Thank you for everything you all do. I know sometimes it can be very challenging sitting in those chairs, I can't even imagine. Um, I just want to say when you voted un unanimously on March 12 to move ahead with the city pool, you rightly pointed out that you are a can-do city council, and that's a great thing. What you should know is you're not alone in this project, and a large group of can-do residents are standing by and actively want to help the city get this done. Unlike the approach taken by the district and school board, you're doing this the right way, and the residents applaud you and appreciate it. The process followed by the district and school board was broken and poor and included such things as actively blocking residents and neighbors from being part of the process 
and even stating that they did not want such input until the end. They also seated their committee heavily with out-of-town non-residents, with only four of those 20 people living here. The district and school board evidently do not appreciate the beauty and tight space constraints of Laguna Beach, which is perhaps why their oversized plan saw nothing wrong with building massive multi-story buildings directly across the street from each other that would essentially block out the sun and create a huge concrete wall corridor up and down park. They cooked up a plan so large, in fact, it would have been the second biggest construction project in Laguna Beach history, only behind the montage, all for the smallest public school district in Orange County and all without any neighborhood or broad resident input. Despite a price tag that ran well into the tens of millions for just the aquatics facility, the district and school board never bothered to hire any of the professional firms that do such things for schools and municipalities across the country. As a result, they did not assess needs up front that would have actually helped determine the true pool size needed to support all programs. When directly challenged on this and encouraged by residents to hire these experts at board meetings, the district and school board ignored these requests and moved ahead anyway. They also took an approach of commonly and repeatedly double counting kids from both city and high school programs to make activity at the pool seem larger. The goal it seemed was to get the usage data as large as possible and apparently muddy who was using the pool, when they were using it and what impact a city pool would have on all of this. On multiple occasions, the district and school board repeatedly stated the city was quote, on board with everything, despite your public comments to the contrary and a process that was underway and evident to anyone who bothered to look. They refused to wait just a handful of weeks for your review process to be completed and even tried to pressure the city to pay over $13 million to build the pool and choke down up to 50 million more in lifetime operating costs. Simply put, the approach taken by the district and school board appears to have been driven by the very top levels and it has not been fiscally responsible, transparent, professional, well thought out, nor prudent. It is good the city did not hitch its wagon to the district and school board on the pool as their approach has certainly severely damaged the way residents now see them as elected officials. I am pleased your approach is more thoughtful and rigorous. So thank you for expediting the city pool and moving ahead the right way. Thank you. Hey, thanks. There are times of charm. Good evening, everyone. Um, Steve McIntosh, also sense of Laguna. Um, just want to say thank you uh, to you guys for voting to, to build a fantastic community pool. It's been a long time in the making, and I think it's going to be great. Uh, so we now have a wonderful opportunity to create something very special through good, solid decision making, something that will serve the entire community for decades to come. And it's uh, very exciting. I, everybody we talk to is very excited about it. Uh, moving forward, we'd like to urge you, the council, the staff and the entire community to keep an open mind about all the possibilities, not just about what can't be done, but instead change that mindset to how can it be done from that won't work to how can we make it work? There are a lot of preconceived notions and rumors out there about traffic, noise, parking related to pool use. Uh, through good communication, education, and plain old show and tell, we believe most of these ideas can be shown to just not be true in this scenario of uh, two pools. The vast majority of, of people here in town, by no fault of their own, have no idea how, when, who, and to what extent the pool was actually used. Uh, even most of those ranting about the need for a 50-meter pool at the high school have no idea about the actual use. So we have some great concepts for helping to educate and show what really goes on at the pool. For instance, most of the noise generated by the pool is from the high school practices, games, and swim meets. The good news is all that stays at the high school and won't be coming along with the community pool. That's easy to show. So through good communication and transparency, we feel that many of these not in favor of the community pool can warm up to the idea. And in the end of the day, they might just take a dip in it themselves. So the importance of keeping the momentum towards finding a location and exploring solutions to minimize the downtime without a place to swim is very important. We have some very viable ideas and solutions, as you well know, for all of the above. And in, as my colleagues have stated, we are ready to help here in any way possible. So put us in, Coach. And again, thank you for your vision and for making the decision not to be bullied by the district for the good of the entire community. Thanks again. Thank you, Steve. Anybody else for public comment here? Okay, I'll close the public comment period and we'll go to uh, city manager and council comments. We'll start with our city manager, Sean. Um, no, no comment uh, this evening, just to say thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed 
every day of it. And uh, thanks to staff for tolerating me. Uh, and thank you to the community for allowing me to be here for seven months and serve you. It's been a, it's been fulfilling. It's been a joy and uh, just reinvigorating as well. So thank you very much, Mayor. Hey, George. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just have one comment. I attended the uh, film last night at the Rivian. Again, this Rivian Theater's uh, really a beautiful venue for having events for, uh, as uh, Tom pointed out, for for Earth Day and for his own event further on, the electrification event that he's planning to have in May. Um, so I'm grateful for that. It was a great uh, turnout, full house, uh, and a lot of fun. I hope you all get to see it. Uh, it really is about Doug Miller and the and the sawdust. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to also thank Village Laguna for hosting the uh, Doug Miller documentary at Rivian. It was it was uh, really enjoyable. I had a great time, and I'd also like to personally thank Sean. I really have enjoyed working with him. I've actually learned quite a bit from him, and um, I wish him well on his future endeavors. And I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding and maybe um, Bob or Alex or Sue, for that matter, could uh, address the issue with the uh, Diane Dixon. Yeah, we will. Bob? Um, yeah, just a couple of things following up on some of the public comments. Um, you know, I think on the ADU issue, uh, hopefully staff will look into that. I mean, if there's truly three feet, that obviously doesn't meet the setback requirements. So. Um, that needs to be uh, verified and hopefully looked at quickly. Um, and then um, the, uh, yeah, on the, uh, the the introduction of the bill, um, that's a bill that we did, similar bill we did, I don't know, five, six years ago for Laguna Canyon Road, um, which simply authorizes uh, the, the state to negotiate with the city about whether a transfer is going to occur somewhere down the road. So there would be multiple hearings and uh, uh, decisions and agreements that would have to be entered into before that happens. It's just sort of a technical clearing like we did on Lagoon Cannon Road. And I think we all talked about it at the strategic planning meeting. So um, that's what that one is. And then um, yeah, I'd like to just add my thanks to Sean. It's been fun to work with him for seven months and uh, uh, got a lot done, a lot accomplished. And obviously from the reception there, I think a lot of people in the community appreciate your efforts. So uh, thank you. Wish we could have stretched it out a little more, but not to be, I guess, thanks to the state of California. But uh, thanks. Thanks for all your thanks for all your service. Yeah, so on the on the ADU issue, um, as I reported two weeks ago, Senator Min pulled um, SB 1085, which I, I believe would have been a really good solution to address, um, to incentivize coastal cities to to build affordable housing and in return get local control about not allowing two-story ADUs. As, as we all know, that was pulled, but he did speak to the executive director of the Coastal Commission who was interested in working with us on an LCP amendment that would address public views, which I told him our city attorney had already uh, move that move that forward so that that was approved I believe by the planning commission and that'll be coming to us soon the only problem is now there's new legislation that uh, by Senator Catherine Blakespear out of Encinitas that um, basically takes the coastal commission out of the whole ADU process so if that if that so if we were able to get the coastal commission to agree to our uh, proposed LCP amendment which would address public views and then this new legislation goes through um, then we're going to be back where we started. So I'm, I'm, uh, I believe as part of our legislative platform, we'd be able to oppose, um, Senator Blakespear's legislation. I hope we will, we will do that. Um, and then, uh, the other thing is just the mayor and I met with, um, uh, supervisor Foley at her offices in, in Santa Ana. And, um, I mean, the mayor can speak about it more, but our goal was to try to get some money from, uh, the supervisor. And so hopefully we, um, I think it was a good meeting. So hopefully we have something that we can, uh, we could bring back some money for um, a lot of for, um, for projects. She also talked about her, all the letters that she's been sending to different state and federal agencies on Laguna Canyon Road. So we appreciate 
for partnership. And then um, the, the final thing I have is um, I attended uh, something called LBHS Flow, which is a, a new program at the high school where they all did uh, three minute videos about different city issues with different solutions. They talked about the vacancies in our downtown businesses. They talked about um, issues with sewer, the sewer system, recycled water, um, a lot of really good presentation. Oh, uh, Coast Highway Safety was another topic. Um, so I'm sure that my colleagues can watch the videos. They, they're uh, very well done. And I appreciate Michael Litchie who joined me on that panel, as well as uh, um, uh, we had uh, a police representative there as well as uh, and from the water district. So I appreciate that. And then um, as far as the, the legislation by Diane Dixon, um, the last time that I've spoken about it was up here with the five of you. So that's, that's, uh, and as Bob said, I, this is not legislation that has any downside. It just allows a process to move forward. So I appreciate, um, staff's work on carrying out council direction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just have a few comments. Um, I attended March 18th. We had the police recognition breakfast, uh, was, uh, the families were there, all the police officers there, very upbeat. Uh, it was five years, been five years since we had, you know, a recognition event and it was great. Um, and I'm uh, really proud of a lot of the police officers that got awards and everybody else that attended. It was a wonderful event. And I want to recognize Captain David Derzinski, who graduated from the 289th uh, session of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. That was the weekend before last, I think. And congratulations. That's quite an honor. Yep. Um, <laughs> Um, on uh, May 29th, as we mentioned, we're going to have the home electrif electrification event at um, Rivian Theater. Tom and Ginger are spearheading that. The city is going to be donating some money for ads, so we're going to be running some ads for that event. So hopefully we'll get some good attendance. I think we only have like, I don't know, 192 homes that have solar panels. So we got a lot of work ahead of us and a lot of opportunity for people to learn. So I'm looking forward to that event. The State of the City, uh, the annual State of the City is April 2nd, um, and it's sold out, but we are going to try to live stream it, so more on that. Uh, I think from Cassie Walder later in the week, um, we're going to be practicing uh, on Thursday. I don't know if practice will help me or not. <laughs> so, um, uh, Alex mentioned Supervisor Foley. Um, she was very receptive. We talked about microgrid. We're going to talk about that later in the meeting, but we talked about the microgrid infrastructure and she's um, very much on board with working with us. So hope to, you know, continue to pursue that, but we gave her a lot of good information. She was quite enthusiastic and quite helpful. Uh, the comment on the Laguna Canyon road. Yeah. That's not even one of our seven priorities. It's something that would be a big reach. We haven't done any work on it. Huh? Yeah, I mean, Coast Highway, yeah, we we have done no work on it, no analysis, nothing, and it's not on our list, so, and I agree with Bob, it's a, kind of a technical thing in nature. Okay, with that, we'll go to our consent calendar, and Council, we have, uh, well, we had 10 items, we have nine, because we pulled number nine, I think, so, anybody want to pull I'd anything? like to pull item four. Four, Alex? And Mayor, I'd like to comment on item six, please. Six, Sean, Okay. Anybody else? Anybody from the public want to pull anything? Come forward. <clears throat> Has item 10 been uh, eliminated? Yeah, it was removed. Yeah. Oh, hey, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'll close the public hearing then. And can I get a motion on the balance of the consent, please? Uh, move items one through three, five, and five through nine, subject to a comment by the city manager on item six. So, All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, item four. Oh, you want to comment on six? Yes, or? thank you. Oh, I thought we were going to do four first. It Wait. is just a comment. Yeah, we didn't pull it. It's just Okay. The city council's, we got a date wrong. <laughs> so the, the story behind the story is we got a date wrong in the staff report. So I'll offer it to you that the city council's action this evening is to set the public hearing date for weed abatement at its May 14th, 2024 meeting. Nothing in the recommended resolution or action this evening is incorrect. 
Uh, however, the agenda report incorrectly states key procedural dates. I think we said 2014 instead of 2024. Mm -hmm. For the benefit of the council and the public, the weed abatement program will proceed with the following process, pending city council approval this evening. May 14th, public hearing to contest abatement requests. May 24th, property must be in compliance with abatement requests. Otherwise, the city will abate the property. And July 9th, staff will recommend properties for assessment of abatement costs on the property tax roll due to noncompliance. And all three of those key dates are 2024. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sean. Okay, um, item number four, Alex. Yeah, so I'm, I'm supportive of this. Um, it's a five-year contract, and this is the one-year option term that's, that was provided for in the, in the contract. But um, I guess what I'd, I'd like to add to the motion is to add... Um, I'd like to go out to RFP at the end or prior to the end of this amendment, um, because I think one of the one of the things I've heard from a lot of business owners as well as residents, and I've seen it firsthand in, uh, in that our approach to parking enforcement is sort of something that would make sense 20 years ago, where, where you're just so, where we have our parking officers looking for different uh, looking for different cars to write tickets. I'd prefer an approach that where we could have enforcement that was linked with our smart parking system because that way we'd be able to get more people to be paying for parking um, as well as look at ideas like business validation where businesses could validate people for their parking. So I guess my my ask would be that we uh, competitively bid this um, at the end of this extension and, and come back to the council with different options as part of, and I think a lot of these ideas that I'm talking about were a part of our parking management plan. Um, I guess a question I'd have on that would, I mean, it sounds like maybe it's a good thing to incorporate, but maybe Michael can comment on this. I mean, we have a fair amount of infrastructure already invested in this, and I don't know whether it, how it transfers or would transfer to a new uh, provider. Um, so could you comment on that? Yes, Mayor Kemp and council members, Michael Litchie, Director of Transit and Community Services. Um, so first, council member Renagi, just to clarify, um, there's a few different systems we're talking about here. The item before you tonight is for the, the frog parking system, which provides parking occupancy information, as well as the ability to pay via a mobile app. Um, however, the the enforcement side that you're talking about is actually something we're already moving forward with in coordination with the police department. So we are uh, in the process of ordering new license plate recognition cameras that will be placed on parking enforcement vehicles, similar to some cameras that already exist on patrol vehicles, but are used for a slightly different purpose. So with that, the parking enforcement officers will be able to, um, from their vehicle, scan license plates to ensure that they've paid um, and it is a bit of a complex program because there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, the parking permits that we issue are another piece of that puzzle. Right now, all those parking permits, as you know, are stickers, physical stickers that have to be looked at in person by the parking enforcement officer. We have another project that's moving forward uh, to automate that process as well. So to make the parking permits license plate based, and that'll be rolled out um, as part of an iterative process. So we are looking at those technology upgrades on the enforcement and the um, the payment side. And then council member Whalen, uh, to your comment, um, we do have a hardware cost that was paid at the beginning of this project, at the beginning of the five-year term to install the sensors. Those sensors are proprietary. So if we did move to another vendor, we would need to pull out those parking sensors and put in new infrastructure to talk with what other whichever vendor we selected. So there would be some upfront costs to switching vendors. So would the plan just be to do a sole source contract ex extension of this this one, or what's the, do we have a plan now of what we would do at the end of the, the year? Yes, yeah, so Mayor Pratham, um, the idea is right now gives us a little extra time to continue the program. We've been able to make a lot of improvements with the existing system. And so our uh, goal over the next couple of months is to look at some other alternatives and decide uh, if if we it would be more cost effective to stay with the current vendor or to go out to RFP for a new vendor to provide similar services. Well, and couldn't we hypothetically do both by doing an RFP? Because if if they could come back and make the case that they've already installed it, that would be something that would give them an advantage. But if, in a hypothetical situation where you know another vendor could could do could do, could do it for a more cost effective way in the long term, why wouldn't we do that? 
right? Right. So the RFP process would give us that information. Okay. So I guess that's 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 what I would say. Michael, I have a question. Um, so you know, we're putting in these sidewalks. Are we going to take this opportunity to put some more paid parking on Coast Highway? Uh, Mayor Kemp, so if I understand your question um, with the Caltrans project, I don't believe that there's been discussion on creating new paid parking zones. That's something that would have to, I believe, go through the Coastal Commission to get authorization to add additional paid parking areas. We are looking uh, as part of that project at areas where it makes sense to replace the single space meters with multi-space parking pay stations, similar to what we have in front of the festival. Coast Highway is a little more complex because there's a lot of driveways in between. And so we're looking at areas where we have a longer stretch um, where people are walking. We're not making them cross the street to make payment, which would reduce the number of uh, people who are willing to make payment. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Well, just um, so on Alex's proposal, I mean, do you, it, is there any downside from staff's position of adding what a requirement to come back? with an RFP for at the end of the end of the year? Is that is that your intention or are you still kind of evaluating? I don't think staff had made a definitive um, decision on how to move forward other than that we wanted to continue with the existing vendor for now and look at options. But if it's the council's direction to go out to RFP, we're happy to do that. And I would assume the existing vendor may be one of the applicants as well. So could we, I'm sure we're gonna get some status updates on the implementation of the parking management plan so could could maybe that during one of those updates that could be the opportunity to for staff to give an update and let us decide we don't have to decide that now does that make sense okay so i'll move the recommended action well wait a minute we haven't opened the public hearing yet oh. anybody want to speak on this item no okay i close the public hearing move the recommended action we'll second all in favor Aye. Bye. Aye. okay Item number 11 has been, is going to be continued um, to a future date, hopefully in May. This is the commercial um, maintenance and beautification ordinance that uh, council member Orgel and I have been working on. Um, that's the plan sometime in May. Okay, that's great. Um, do I need to take public comment on the continuance? Probably do, right? Anybody want to comment on the, I'll be in the public hearing. Anybody want to comment on this continuance? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, any any comments on this, council, or can I have a motion? Move the recommended action. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Thank you. Okay, item number 12, the solar panel assessment, microgrid re resiliency, electric fleet, conversion and climate action and adaptation plan update. Hi, guys. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Jeremy Fremont, Assistant City Manager. With me this evening is Frank Lopez, Assistant City Engineer. And then online, we also have uh, Jonathan Whelan, who is with Optony. He's a VP of Onsite Energy Programs. Should you have any technical questions beyond any of our capabilities as it pertains to the, uh, the microgrid portion of this report. As the title suggests, we have a lot to work through. I'm going to try to keep it at high level and uh, circle back with any questions that the council may have. Let me get this up here quickly, bear with me. There we go. Okay, thank you. Just a couple of uh, context slides. Before we get into it, we'll start with the microgrid resiliency assessment. This report, Optineer, the consultant, assessed four locations for a microgrid system. For the benefit of the council or the public tonight, what is a microgrid system? It's a solar panel system that's connected to a battery energy storage system. The solar panels generate energy directly to the facility or the batteries. Batteries are also connected to the grid, and there's a computer basically between those two systems determining when power is going to the facilities from what source. The benefits of 
This system of a microgrid system is uninterrupted power supply in the event of loss of power, which allows the city to continue its operations with little impact. In some locations, you will realize utility cost savings over the lifetime of these systems. It does help provide a foundation for the city, well, allows the city to achieve its environmental goals through programs such as electrical fleet conversion. In my last context site, uh, context setting slide here is the concept this evening. I will be referring to 24, 48, and 72 hour systems. That's the reserve or the reservoir power systems to each of these locations. And it's important to note when we say the each of those durations, first off, the modeling at 24, 48, 72 is if we kept business as usual, all the lights on, air condition running, however we normally operate. At a night, will we get that duration and reserve power at a 90% confidence interval? And as we delve into the electric world, one thing to consider is that it's not like gasoline, right? We get 24 hours to the tank and then we're out. So a 24 hour system does regenerate. So you can see, and if you look in the report, uh, the microgrid report in these locations, a 24 hour system can also provide power to 71% confidence interval, and then so on and so forth. It's regenerative. That's my 101. Now I'd like to quickly go through the financial analysis of the four sites, starting with the Suzy Q and Community Center. This site was included because of its cooling center and it's frequently used by the community. Because of shade location uh, for solar panels and sizing, what we see is over a 25 year lifespan from a cost perspective, it uh, it doesn't really pan out. The ROI is negative and your net present value uh, is a negative value as well. Meaning that the upfront cost will exceed the 25 year life say or 25 year utility saving and credits and so forth. So I'm gonna move over that one. Our next site we looked at is the Corp Yard. We selected this site predominantly because uh, operations run out of here. The city's fleet runs out of here. There is public parking. And what we can see is that this site would yield a return on investment. In the pictures, as you go through, you'll see blue strips. Those are proposed solar panel locations, just for clarification. And also, these are, these are concepts. This isn't the final design, the final plan. It just kind of gives you a sense of the footprint of what type of solar panel. I mean, can that go on the roof? Yes. Can it go on the left side of the picture? Yes. Conceptually, just to see the footprint of these systems. But from a financial perspective, we do see uh, the Corp Yard has a, a pretty good return on investment, particularly at the 24-hour system. That's a recommendation from the consultant. Um, and that's, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Gonna Beach Community Recreation Center. We looked at this site because it will potentially be the, or it will be the future site of the Emergency Operations Center and the gymnasium might be able to serve as a refuge site during any evacuation or emergency event. We scaled it down to just building A and B, the system um, for some cost savings. And in this site, the consultant recommended a 48 hour system versus 24 at the other four locations. And the reason for that is this site does not have a generator, whereas City Hall has a generator and the Corp Yard has a generator. So they're recommending a 48 to kind of to bridge that here. The last site that was looked at was City Hall campus. This was looked at for obviously city operations. You have public safety located here, public parking, a number of uses. We can see um, generally a return on investment and a net present value, uh, both in the positive there as well. From an environmental perspective, and I included this slide, the council did request, right, this this report was is part of the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. It said, staff, identify the low-hanging fruit and the obvious projects that would come out of this and bring it ahead of the 18-month process. So this is what this report is tonight. And what we see the, the greenhouse gas reduction projections here is those four systems with microgrid systems installed would offset about 15% of the city's carbon footprint, not citywide, but the city as an organization, right? About 400 metric tons of CO2. That's what MTCO2 stands for. And you can see, so that's the, the measurable 
reduction from these proposed programs. The next steps for the microgrid, uh, we understand, or I understand council, that what I have just run through in a, a couple of minutes is about $15 million worth of infrastructure. We understand that's probably not all happening tonight. We are seeking guidance uh, if there are any locations that we should focus our efforts on for the next stage of this process, which is preparing an RFP and see if we can refine the cost estimates that are provided in this report using the specifications identified. And we wanna look at different purchasing options. Our goal is to provide this information, to run through this process and provide this information to council during the budget workshop in May. It is a tight timeline, but we are committed to trying to meet that. And if not, certainly have a more refined um, cost for design permitting installation. I'm now going to turn it over uh, to my colleague here, Frank, to discuss the fleet conversion implementation plan. We both were working, just some background here, we were both working independently on the microgrid and the fleet conversion and realized that rather than being in two separate silos, we should work lockstep together as these systems seem to be interlinked. So Frank, do you like that? That one should go on or do you want... Good evening, Council. Uh, Frank Lopez, Assistant City Engineer. Um, regarding the fleet electrification, uh, back in June of 2021, uh, the Council uh, directed staff to look at the feasibility of uh, converting the city's fleet uh, to EV. Um, subsequent to that, uh, there was an RFP and a bidding process uh, contract which was awarded to ICF to do a fleet uh, electrification and EV charging infrastructure master plan. Uh, that master plan came back to the council in June of 2023, at which time it was accepted. And then council further directed staff to um, seek consultant services for implementation. Uh, in February of 24 of this year, um, an RFP was posted to plan of bids. Uh, about 50 uh, firms downloaded the RFP. Uh, we received about five bids. And um, from that process, uh, we selected uh, one of the consulting firms, uh, ICF. Um, obviously, as uh, Jeremy's been presenting, the benefits to fleet electrification, as well as uh, solar, uh, reducing our carbon footprint, reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, in regards to this, clean transportation and sustainability, uh, as well as meeting state mandates. Um, so transitioning the fleet uh, requires a lot of planning, uh, allocation of resources. Uh, it's very complex, you have charging, yeah, fleet electrification, how do those work together? Uh, what are the requirements, time? Uh, how long do the batteries last? What is the best way, best time to charge? And so that is uh, part of the reason I think that it was recommended to seek a consultant to assist with this. Um, additionally with that, um, you know, as Jeremy mentioned, he was working on the micro grid system and it just makes sense that if uh, we're gonna convert uh, our fleet to electric vehicles, which are gonna draw power rather than always uh, paying an electric bill on that, that we uh, source some of that ourselves through the solar panels and, and have a net, uh, you know, zero, hopefully, um, cost. Um, so um, that is part of the reason too, we're coordinating these efforts to make sure we're in lockstep that as the uh, fleet implementation gets developed, it's uh, fully aware of what the microgrid system might be doing and, and where we can uh, best uh, save and be efficient in what we do. As I mentioned, ICF uh, was selected uh, through a panel. Uh, it was uh, the highest rated firm uh, uh, due to, yes, sorry. Sorry. Oh no, that was already there. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, it was selected as the best firm for several reasons. Um, 
one, they had the, the largest uh, team uh, with depth and breadth of knowledge in this field, um, which in turn would help uh, provide a near-term uh, product that can be used both uh, to begin the process to convert fleets, but also for the microgrid system. Um, this, uh, they'll also be assisting the city in preparing uh, RFPs uh, for uh, the procurement of the charging stations as well as the vehicles. Uh, they will be assisting in providing training to staff as we transition to fleet, It'll be a different type of maintenance cycle for the new vehicles. And obviously they will assist us in implementing all of this, managing all of this. They would also be assisting in um, looking at grant funding and, and prioritizing and directing us and what would be the best way uh, to seek that the grants that apply for, for this. So I'll hand it back to Jeremy. Sure, uh, thanks Frank. And just a couple other points with this firm and what we liked is for one, their their implementation approach, uh, all the beds we received was a 12 month approach to this report, but due to the size of ICF's team, they can really front load deliverables in the first six months, right? We can get to work. We don't have to wait 12 months. If you look at the timeline in front of you, the majority of past month seven is procurement. It's just it's just waiting. Things are on plan of bids. So that was attractive to us. And as Frank mentioned, this is a complicated process, uh, both with the RFP, the reviewing, and I think the overall program could benefit from having assistance, technical ex uh, experience or assistance during procurement and preparing the workforce, as, as Frank mentioned. So that wraps up the EV implementation plan. And then the, the final part of everything under the sun, uh, electric and green energy is our, our climate action and adaptation plan time up late, or update. I will keep this brief. Jeremy, do you mind if we had a request to ask questions about the first two presentations? I was, yes, Mayor, I was gonna say, this is kind of a natural stopping point yeah. if we wanna have yeah. questions on this part. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first, thank you for, for all this. Um, for the solar, um, and this might be a question for the consultant online, do we have any idea about what a power, about which of these facilities we would have a solar developer be willing to do a power purchasing agreement in which we wouldn't need to be putting um, capital on the front end? Uh, Jonathan, I can, I'll just take a crack at this first. Uh, that's part of the process. We want to see, I mean, and get an understanding and, and ask that question. Yeah. So when um, we go out for RFP, we could potentially get several of these sites where we don't have to put any money into it and they would, and these developers would pay our long-term operating costs. Theoretically. Yes. We're going to bid for direct purchase and PPA. And then are we going to, okay. So that could potentially put, what was the dollar amount you said earlier, Jeremy, about the total cost? 10 to 15. So in that scenario, we could potentially could be a lot less money on the front end if if we were able to get, um, we might we probably wouldn't be able to get that for like Suzy Q, for example, because it just doesn't pencil out. But for the other sites, that that's a possibility. So that would be part of the the RFP. That is one of the benefits of a PPA. Got it. And then, um, for the, would we also be? I saw that in the ESC recommendation, they they asked us to um to just look at American made batteries. Would that analysis also be part of it? Because I understand that the tax credits allow um there's certain you can get a tax credit from using certain types of batteries. So I'm sure that analysis would also be part of the RFP. If yeah, if the council included that in the direction, I mean, we would. So we don't have to decide. We can just say we can they can they can bid on the different options. Mm -hmm. is is like i'm sorry i lost your so question there there's a trade-off in doing the in procuring a certain type of battery right because on one from on one hand it could it could add to the cost but it also could i, I believe you get an extra uh five or ten percent tax credit i don't have it off the top of my head so do we need to make that decision now or could when we do the rfp the respondents would be able to give us those different options well, we could include it. I mean, we're going to be looking and making recommendations based on what's going to provide the highest ICF credit. I mean, we to you know to reduce costs. 
um, we can provide a menu of options of domestic, unless you would like us only to look at cool. domestic procurement. I guess what what I'm saying, yeah, because I I think the best the best way to do this is just do an RFP and have them give us the different options because we don't really know right now what the different options are going to be. Like in terms of infrastructure equipment, like yes. the actual panels like themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because what's and what's the downside of of just putting all four of these sites out for for RFP? So there's not a downside to it, other than just if you wanted us to focus in on any. Particularly, if the council there was consensus for us to maybe focus on certain sites over others yeah. at the onset, and well, maybe down the line return back for another site for further analysis. Because I guess that, that's why I think we should have just done from the beginning, just done RFP, because then we'd be able to figure out what the because we might be able to potentially do all of them for a very small amount of money through our purchasing agreement. So that's um, so okay. That that's helpful. And then on the on the electric vehicles. Um, this one is harder for me because we, we paid ICF, um, a lot of money to develop a master plan. And then now we're doing an implementation plan with, you know, funding is one of the things in this, they did funding in their last report. So I guess I'm okay. Or, um, I'm not going to get into comments, but is it staff's perspective? This is the right, this is the way that we're going to be able to get this going quickly. Yeah, I think it'll help ensure forward progress on this priority and, uh, provide assistance, particularly during, you know, in previous, we've previous discussions and stated a procurement agent yeah. for the city or buyer's agent that they would assist, they would for, be, fulfill that role for us. For the electric vehicles. Yeah. For the implementations arm of this. Yeah. And then my final question is going back uh, to solar. Do, do you feel like there, that there's a need for a buyer's um, like an owner's representative or buyer's agent for the procurement of the, um, of the solar? I think it would provide a similar service and ensure forward progress. Okay. Um, it would support be it would support staff during certainly particularly heavily administrative portions of this process, preparing an RFP, for example. Yeah. So I, um, I think this is from my conversations with the the city manager, but I think Jeremy, you got a bid for an owner's representative for the solar. I did. I actually asked Jonathan if Optimity, I mean, they prepared the the microgrid report. I asked them what this next phase would look like for that type of for procurement assistance. And so, they provided it. Yeah, they provided a quote for that. So a uh, question for, for Jonathan. Um, do you can you give a, do you think we would be able to do to do this? Can you or what's make the case for why having an owner's representative for the procurement of solar would be helpful? Sure, and, and good evening. Hello, everyone. Um, the case is just the 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 background knowledge and experience having done this for, I think we've probably helped maybe 40 to 50 municipalities, maybe more than that, uh, forward with, with solar procurements. Uh, there's just a lot of nuances to the technology that, um, that I don't think a municipality can generally expect staff to become an expert on for a one-off project. And so that's where we come in. Uh, basically act as a, as an, a, a full-time equivalent FTE for the, for the municipality um, to, to get the project done. And that's what we focus on. I, I come from industry myself and, and the developer world. And so I like to see projects happen. And so i uh, really excited to hear you say, uh, I'd rather just go to the RFP and skip the report. That's actually my perspective as well, but really? happy, okay. to, to do the, happy to do the report so that it does help to set a baseline and, and expectations of, um, of of where you might want to see uh, a project go, you know, both from a, an approach perspective, as well as a site perspective, as well as a size perspective. It's helps help set parameters for the RFP. So you need to have some of that, but uh, yeah, we'd be happy to help uh, help the city go forward. So then what's the downside of just putting like all of our fire stations, all of our buildings into that RFP and letting the market decide, you know, that's the, the the extreme to the other end. Uh, why, why wouldn't we do that? I think it's a great question. It does. We, we, we've tried that actually in the past. We worked with a, um, a, a conglomerate of agencies in the Bay Area. I think it was 19 public agencies, something like 187 sites. There was a lot of interest, but when you started to get to some of the smaller sites that got added to larger sites, you'd see a drop in interest. They just, they just, for the last, 
to put it bluntly, the developers see it as a waste of their time. They're really they're going to cherry pick the the most viable projects. They're going to complain about having smaller. Uh, what we see is maybe a um, kind of a middle road is to go forward with an RFP that includes the most viable sites, and then leave the door open to add on additional sites with your preferred vendor. Generally speaking, those are going to be small add-ons, but could you know, could be great. You know, could could it hit those smaller fire stations? That that would be wonderful to add to the resiliency uh, portfolio. So, so Jonathan, if we were to go forward with a procurement contract with Optini, you would you be able to recommend what other viable sites would be that should be included in that beyond these four? If if they existed, maybe they don't. I, I think so. I think that we'd have to do that in in coordination with staff to with talk staff. through. Certainly, talk through the resiliency needs of of various facilities, but but certainly. I'd have, okay. be happy to do that and and thank you thank you anybody else on the first well I, I don't know who this question is for but in the recommendation uh first recommendation you're asking for direction from council to whether we proceed with a 24 48 or 72 hour reservoir um option i i don't know as though it's so sounding like we need to pick one or the other but I guess my question is, uh, for example, on the corporation yard, the recommendation here is a consultant's recommendation is for a 24 hour system, but for a net present value reduction of just a hundred thousand dollars, I can have a 48 hour system. So why would I not opt for that? Jonathan? Sure. Happy to address that. What uh, what we see is that there is just a reduction in the marginal benefit. In this, in that case, in the corporation yard, you're right. That is a pretty minimal marginal um, marginal marginal net costs, if you want to say it that way. But once you get to these levels, these sizes of batteries, every additional kilowatt hour battery you add increases the cost. It also increases the benefits, but to a, to a lesser extent, so the marginal benefit is less. And so with the corp yard having an existing de uh, diesel generator on site, we were just hard pressed to make the case that you should spend the money for a larger battery system when you already had backup to the backup. N n you know, certainly you could make the other, the, go the other route and, and pursue a 48 hour resiliency um, uh, best battery system. Um, but, but that was the rationale. Okay, I, I that I can comment more on that later, uh, and then um, on the timeline, I guess that Jeremy you had in the presentation, or you and Frank had the, in the presentation. So I had a question. Can you pull that up on the screen? Just a or, Okay, so the um, maybe it was on the prior page actually. Yeah, proposal evaluation, collaborating with staff to evaluate and select vendor. So that's clear. But then you're saying we're in procurement. Maybe they go to the next page. What are we procuring in the second half of the twelve month period? When you say infrastructure procurement, so EV infrastructure, what does that encompass? Yes, Council Member Whalen. Uh, that would be procuring uh, the charging equipment um, initially. Um, and, and if we were ready by then, um, potentially even looking at procuring vehicles. But I think initially it would be the procurement of the charging infrastructure. Okay. And built into this schedule, uh, may this may for, be for the city attorney, but have we got whatever CEQA compliance we have to do built into this timeline? It should be. Yeah, yeah I'm looking through it right now to see what task it falls under. I know the answer. It should be. We have preliminary uh, drawing. Whether it is. Okay. Anyway, you guys can look at that. That obviously would get built in. I'm just wondering whether that's going to impact our timeline. Just... Uh, can we do that in an overlap way when we're working on something else? 
Well, part of it's site evaluation as well, right? We're having it's scoped to evaluate three sites, council's decision. So then, yeah, that would trigger the process. I think once we have those locations fleshed out, we wouldn't miss CEQA. Well, in other words, once you have direction from us tonight as to which sites to proceed with, you'll trigger that. Yeah. Okay. Those are my questions. Thanks. Uh, Jeremy, I have a couple of questions here. I, I think the corporate yard obviously is a, a big target because of the ROI. Uh, it's also a target because you're going to be putting the charging stations there first, I imagine. Correct. Uh, so in tandem, does that change the ROI at all? You're going to increase the demand for electricity at that, that site, the corporate yard? How Actually, that work? the report and the analysis incorporated the increased consumption okay. from the results of the electric vehicle and electric infrastructure, master, I, ma the master plan. Uh, it incorporated all that. Okay. And so what we're getting here, I and mean, I want to be clear, not just the solar system, but a backup for emergency power should uh, main power fail, which it has in the downtown area too often, I suppose. Um, so we're getting the benefit of that for 24, 48, or 72 hours, depending on what we choose. And it seems like 24 is the best option for most sites. Um, so this will be, I mean, these two RFPs will be rolled out sort of simultaneously to get the best a coordination of effort for the solar and then implementation of of the vehicle charging stations but at the same time you need cars to plug into them so how does that work but it's a chicken and the egg but if we do look at the fleet electrification and the electrical vehicle charging infrastructure master plan there we go have it written down here uh it says year one of your implementation is you got to get the infrastructure in the ground yeah Okay, and then and then you start just so you start cost. procurement. And going back to the purchasing power agreement, I know that some big hedge funds are getting into this and doing school districts in places like Liverside. They don't own any infrastructure; everything's put in there uh, as a purchase back agreement. I'm not sure financially how well it does because, as you said, they're looking for the big sites, big school districts, easy to put up over a parking lot and generate a lot of power rather than putting them here, here, and here. So um, y y that that's something we are going to look at or, or not. I can't remember Alex's question about that. Uh, is that something that we should look at at all or not? Yeah, no, that, that's the intent of staff is to look at direct purchase and then power, per power purchase, power procurement, yeah. EPA. P direct purchase power agreement. Yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we... I've, I've seen the same thing as I was going through my research. I mean, I'm looking at a lot of these facilities are megawatts. I'm not, and, and not our cities in kilowatts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Jonathan might be able to explain scale there, and but it's important for us, I think, to ask that question, see what the market brings back to us for the council to consider and contemplate. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Proceed. Okay. Okay, climate action and adaptation plan update. Well, you can see check marks are what uh, my staff and the the group of members from ESC and EDPC have been assisting staff with their their expertise, and see where we are in the process. Um, kind of about halfway, but we've completed our greenhouse gas inventory, the vulnerability assessment. We're just kind of putting some final touches on it, and and that'll be completed. And the then we have our target setting memo and gap analysis. All four of those documents are available on the city's website. Should any member of the public want to read those, review those, and follow along, I also do have a sign up form to stay informed on the on the city's website too, just below all those forms. But what we've done 
at a high level is we've completed the context setting portion of the cap. It is what are your vulnerabilities? What is your carbon footprint? What are all the documents, the planning documents, the emergency documents the city has done in the past? Let's aggregate all of those together. And then based on all of those different components, what are the gaps? What are the perceived gaps? And then, and where we are today is highlighted and, and pretty much hot off the press is the development of reduction and adaptate adaptation strategies. So we just had our uh, the consultant Placeworks just provided us their first draft. We're in the preliminary stages of digesting that document. We will, again, we'll make that available online. But our intent is to engage the community at this point, stakeholder workshops, certainly bring this to the council down the line. So you all have, or pardon me, the city council has an understanding of the policies and what areas. Uh, and then kind of once we we've firmed up that section, the overall document will be compiled, presented, uh, as well as our implementation monitoring. Pardon me, I forgot that. It'll receive CEQA analysis, which has benefits down the line for future projects. And then um, we had initially targeted September to bring this forward. We're, we're still in probably about two months behind that. Um, the good news is we're on budget. All right, we're we're still on budget, but we wanted to spend a little bit more time on the vulnerability assessment. We the group thought that that needed a little bit more work to make it more understandable and uh, for the community, and that's kind of we've seen a slight delay of about a month. But I'm just going to leave it at that. That's high level. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities coming down the pike for public participation in this project as we shift to the strategy portion of the cap. And. Uh, Here's our last page in conclusion. Again, we're seeking direction on size and location. Uh, we're recommending a contract award to ICF to assist with the EV fleet implementation and conversion process. And um, yeah, I'll just I'll just leave it there. And that's uh, that's it today. That's a summary of our recommendations. We're available for further questions. Thanks. Questions, anybody? No, okay, I'll open the public hearing. Anybody want to speak on this item? Please come forward. I'm Ginger Osborne, and I want to thank the city council members for your leadership on moving forward, on providing solar panels on city buildings and the electrification of our fleet. This is very important, and... You've done a good job. Thank you. Thanks, Ginger. Tom Osborne. I want to second what my wife just said. Uh, back in 2006 to 2008, when I chaired the work group that wrote the Climate Protection Action Plan, uh, we had big dreams. And we worked our tail ends off on that climate protection action plan that our council accepted uh, unanimously. And I have to say, at this point, what I've heard tonight on this report from Jeremy and others, uh, it, in, in a way, it's, it's just kind of bringing home the dream that we had back then. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Steve Chatham, uh, as you know, I on the Environmental Sustainability Committee, but I also am on the ad hoc group that uh, Jeremy mentioned, three of us from ESC and three from EDPC that are working with the consultants on the cap, as well as these individual component pieces. So uh, as uh, Alex noted in the uh, staff report, we are recommending adoption of the microgrid Report. We haven't uh, really had a chance to review the uh, the uh, fleet electrification plan, but in that case, uh, definitely uh, want to support that. Um, I want to sort of step away from the official document, as it were, and answer some of the questions or the concerns that I think you have. Um, this whole question of of PPAs versus purchase. Um, yes, it's important to 
to understand the, the different economic impacts, the clear appeal of a PPA is uh, no money up front. The downside of a PPA is that you don't own the systems and the um, you often don't get a lot of the direct benefits from the system itself. So you really have to kind of weigh those things um, a little bit more carefully, like what things are of value to you. Um, the other thing that uh, struck me with the consultant's recommendation about 24 versus 48 versus 72 hours, um, a lot of those recommendations were based on the financial analysis is sort of where the sweet spot is in the ROI and uh, the payback. But something else to consider that uh, is really not um, not something that I think they have the ability to, to uh, evaluate, really only you do, is what do you think the probability of the town being out of power for 24 hours or 48 or 72 hours is? Um, I don't remember what happened in 93 with the big fire because I left, <laughs> I had to evacuate. So I don't know how much of the town was without power or uh, how much impact there was on, on critical facilities within the city, but you folks are in the position to be able to think through those issues. And I think that, la that layer of additional um, thinking might, you might want to add on to the question of duration. Um, so, but I do strongly encourage you, we, we're having a great time working with the consultants and I think we're going to, uh, it's going to be a, a good work product at the end. So just a quick, quick question. So I agree about the, the trade-offs. Your, your position would be that we should have the market give, give us options about whether to go forward with, right? No, no and, point in not having options. Okay. So. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. That was good. Uh, Matt Lawson, uh, as you know, I've been a member of EDPC for quite some time, and I'm also part of the working group advising Jeremy and we're having the pleasure of working with our staff members. And I want to compliment the good work that Aaron and particularly Jeremy have been doing on this, because I think it's a very complicated project and it's a very difficult project. And uh, Jeremy has done a great job keeping us focused and, and moving forward. Um, I think Steve raised a very, very key element of this, which is it's not just about the cost, it's not just about the odds, it's about the stakes. And uh, I don't know what the odds are that we're going to have a major catastrophe here that's going to knock out power to our essential facilities for some period of time, but it certainly can happen. And if it does happen, particularly if it is a result of a major seismic event, uh, we have to understand that the CRC, that $25 million purchase that we undertook not long ago, isn't just about fun and games and a place to recreate. It's also about having a, the only seismically competent structure that belongs and facility that belongs to the city at present. And that's not my opinion. That was uh, brought forth by the city engineer, now the acting director of public works, in a staff report to city council in January of last year. Uh, therefore, I would urge that you give very careful consideration to the public safety aspects of this, as Steve suggested, and look at where we need to have power in the worst eventualities, where we're going to need and for how long we might need it, because that grid could go down for 24, 48, 72 hours or, or longer at any given time if we have a major regional disaster. And we're right at the, uh, uh, according to a report just published a year ago, by both FEMA and USGS, we're basically the Anaheim, Long Beach, Los Angeles area, census area, is kind of the leading uh, area in the United States in terms of expected damage from seismic events indefinitely into the future. So we're right in that bullseye, that's, we're part of that zone, and we need to be very cognizant of that and prepare for it, because it will happen here someday, we just don't know when. But again, I want to compliment the fine work that staff has done. I'm totally supportive of their recommendations. And uh, I'm a big believer, by the way, in free markets and uh, free medium sodas. So good luck. And uh, let's move forward with this as expeditiously as possible. I think microgrids are a great, great example of sustainability and creating uh, and abetting public safety. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Judy Mancuso, Environmental Sustainability Committee. 
Um, I want to thank Jeremy and Steve and Shelly, everyone that's been on the CAP committee for all their good work. And um, I was not here for the fires. I moved here in 1995, but I did live through the Northridge earthquake and the uh, Rodney King LA riots where we were out of power for three days. So, you know, the more reliant we can be on ourselves versus Southern California Edison, uh, the better off we'll be. And uh, to echo uh, Steve's point and uh, Matt's point as well, that, you know, sometimes uh, you can't even put a price on this security and uh, contingency planning that we could be doing. So thank you again. Hey, thanks, Judy. Anybody anybody else want to speak on this item? I'm going to set my timer. Oh, okay. I'll I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to. Oh, you want to? I'm comment? serious. Oh, I thought you were <laughs> messing around over there. Um, I'm okay. speaking as myself, Anne Marie McKay, um, as a member of the public, not as the city clerk. I sent an email about a week and a half ago to the council requesting that you direct staff to consider including the Laguna Beach Animal Shelter. We now know that the community center is not really a viable option. So maybe we can throw in the animal shelter. Um, it would be similar, I think, to the courtyard and in a similar area. And um, it's important to this community, important to the animals. And as it is, every time the power goes out, they have no running water. And so I don't know if you're aware of that. So um, I just want to speak on behalf of the animals at the shelter and the staff there to please not forget the shelter that's out there on the canyon taking care of all the little Homeless animals. Thank you, Emory. Anybody else? Okay, I'll, now I will close the public. Okay, then bring it back to council. Comments, council? Uh, Jeremy, I have a question for you about uh, this is like a three legged stool. You have to build the solar power, the battery backup, the infrastructure to put the vehicles plugged in. And then is there a plan then to? Uh, I mean, we don't do fleet conversions. We haven't done that. We did buy incrementally as time goes on. What's your thought with that? Because it's obviously uh, we could do that as well down the road. Uh, how would how would that impact this, or is that something you considered? Well, the 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 scope of the first five years is yeah. to look at our fleet. How our fleet's changed over the last two years since the last assessment. We've taken over South Laguna, yeah. for example. Operations have changed in the last few years, so reevaluate that, uh, and then and then provide us a plan, uh, give us a running start on a five year conversion plan, near term conversions. Okay. I guess that. yeah. My other question is on uh, is 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 you know the corporate yard seems like an obvious one. LBRC. RC is the obvious one, buildings A and B, um, City Hall and the building lift station. But then we're talking about the Suzy Q not necessarily being a, um, why was that in there in the first place, the Suzy Q? I mean, it generates some power, but is it? For the cooling was, center. What was your thoughts? It's a cooling center and a refuge okay. site and an emergency. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, may I go, Madam, Madam Mayor? Um, I want to ask permission here. Um, so, you know, I asked a question on, on the front end. Steve helped shed some light on it, and Matt did as well. So, on the, you know, on the 24, 48, 72 hour, um, you know, resiliency question, um, you had a chart up earlier. I mean, my, my, bias is to go for the longer one, especially at the corp yard. It's minimal hit on net present value savings. Um, it is more expensive up front, but if you're looking at net present value, but you know, why wouldn't we want to have a, that's the kind of the hub, that's the nerve center, right? For yeah. our fleet. Why wouldn't we want to have a 72 hour resiliency there? I'm not saying that's the right answer. That's just my gut. I'd want to have more, not less. And um, 
another question, I guess, on the city hall lift station, which is putting solar on that. Um, but we all know we've had tremendous liability. City has had tremendous liability for sewage spills, right? Uh, due to a variety of factors, but a, a lack of power to a lift station could could cause that, right? So, um, and I, I know it's not exactly your guys bailiwick, but um, I think it's great we're getting, we'd have some backup on the city hall lift station, which drives the main line down to um, the coastal treatment plant. And maybe Mark Trestick's here. I don't know if Mark's the right guy either. But as we think about this process, and maybe um, as Jonathan was saying, you can add things on in the future. I know we've got backup generators here and there. I don't have a good idea of system-wide whether we do. But I just wonder whether, you know, as a maybe a second phase on this, we should be thinking about all the lift stations or, or a lot of the lift stations to make sure that if power goes out, we don't have a, you know, a, a sewer problem at the same time. Absolutely. And, and that was the intent of this report is to not only identify four sites up front that are these high priority sites, but create a playbook for future because this isn't a one stop project. I mean, that's what we've heard from the council. This is a priority of the council. So let's take the opportunity to include a lift station. We now understand a lift station and a process, right? We understand its energy requirements and have formulated hopefully a playbook for, as you mentioned, lift stations and other sites in the in the community. A couple other observations, and then I'll let the other council members go. On the um, looking through the report, um, uh, you know, the um, on the city hall campus. This is on page eighteen of the report. We're obviously going to have to, you know, evaluate. There's, they have a recommendation as to five locations there that I guess drive the numbers that are in the chart. I mean, there's obviously, you know, visual impacts of number one in particular, and we're going to have to look at that through the process and evaluate it. Um, on the, um, uh, on the. Uh, Laguna Beach Community and Recreation Center. Um, you know, I, I think down there, just looking at that, I mean, something I would hope there might be support for us to look at as we explore through the process is, this is on page 28 of the report, there's a visual there. Um, you know, is there any capability of, on the hillside behind the building, not, I'm not talking about way up on the, where we might have, you know, visual in, intrusion, but behind the building kind of down lower there, is there any ability to add there and increase capacity? I'd want to see if that could be evaluated in the process. Um, and then um, just an observation, I think the other night we were all at the water district board meeting where they ended up on the reservoir, the two reservoirs, they ended up determining to go direct purchase as opposed to, you know, power purchase agreement. So it's interesting. We've had one conclusion by staff over there. I know it's going to be evaluated here. Um, but I do think um, when it comes back, I'd really like a good analysis of pros and cons on the power purchase agreement versus the direct purchase. Um, I think what Steve was saying was that if you're, if it's just somebody purchasing your power and it's going back into the system, it's a little different than you're consuming your own power on site. I think you also have, there also is some credit risk with per power purchase agreements, depending on the, the counterparty on the other side of the, the agreement. So anyway, a good analysis of pros and cons would be helpful when that, when that comes back. Um, but um, great job. Um, as Tom and Ginger said, I mean, it's really good to, I didn't realize it was that long ago, but it's good to be bringing this thing to fruition. Uh, and uh, I'm supportive of all of it. I would want to hear from other council members, but I'd be supportive of, you know, a lo the longer resiliency periods, uh, at least on a, at least on the corp yard. And um, it seems to make not very much difference on the lift station as well. So I'd be, I'd be opting for the longer scenarios there. For, for 72. Yeah, for 72, I really don't think it's much of a financial. I, I would agree with that. I, I just have a question on, on that score. I mean, it's uh, why don't we just look at all options for all all these sites at the same time and we make the decision down the road. We don't necessarily need to choose tonight 
um, because it'll just come back to us in a matrix form and we'll know. Um, on the power purchase agreement, uh, what kind of, I don't even know if you have battery backup for that kind of a system. You buy you buy power under the agreement, they they install everything and, and then you may pay a premium for uh, backup. I know you still have a battery system. The way it works at a high level is you basically just get a fixed 25 year rate that is heavily subsidized because you're providing yeah. the land. Yeah. So instead of, let's say, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, you get 25 yeah. years locked at 16. But, but do those those agreements provide oversimplification? But yeah, you still have your battery. Just when that battery drains, you're filling it back up at 16 cents a kilowatt hour instead of okay. market rate. Okay. Thank you. And that's a simplification of it, but the gist. So question for, so if we were to direct staff to, um, to move forward with, a, with procurement for, um, or with, with assistance for procurement, um, that would have to be an RFP because it exceeds the $75,000 limit. So, cause we don't have a sole source policy here. Is that right? So we couldn't make findings and say, even though that this group just made it, did a report on it. That's not justification. Currently, that's that's the, the policy. City's policy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. I. I. I guess stepping back, I think that we really have to look at what is success as we as we look at all this climate act, um, these efforts on climate action. To me, success is not a beautifully written report. Success is action, and you know our kids aren't going to be like, oh, those, you know. Uh, that was a really great report. They're going to say, oh, it's great that they were able to get solar on all of our facilities. Um, I think it's also fiscally irresponsible to not take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, as we as we know, this is the biggest investment in the history of the United States in in climate action. And even if someone didn't believe in climate action, they should believe in fiscal responsibility. And we know that these tax credits that we're getting um, – which for the first time ever, the federal government is allowing direct payments so cities can take advantage of it. Um, a lot of these are going to rely uh, run out by 2032. So I think it's really incumbent upon us to make these strategic investments over the next, you know, it's coming up eight years um, to, to really leverage these funds because we don't know what's going to happen at the national level. So why wouldn't we want a 30% tax credit on solar that we could get through direct pay? That, that's how I look at this. So then the question becomes, how do we move beyond analysis paralysis and stop studying this and figure out how we move forward? And I strongly believe, I, I, I spent a lot of time on this because I'm frustrated, quite frankly, at what's going on, at the way we've done it at the Water District, where we were doing it the right way and now we're not. Um, I I looked, I, I actually happened to find the report or the, the effort that Optini worked on. I didn't know that, that Optini did it, but we're in Silicon Valley. They got like, I don't know, 20, how many agencies, like 20, uh, a significant amount of agencies to come together and basically procure, procure it together, have an owner's representative who doesn't have a financial interest in it. So they're able to give uh, our staff the technical assistance to really make sure that we're getting the right pricing. And as we're working with, with the solar developer, we can really do it in the way that's the that's best for us, um, which as Bob mentioned, I think it's important to have those trade-offs from an independent third party. So I really like that, that idea, because that's also just the proven model of what's worked. Um, I, I am supportive. I think eventually I would like to have our animal shelter have solar. I'd like to have all of our fire stations have solar, and, you know, or both of these have solar batteries, all of our lift stations, as Bob pointed out. But at this, at this point, what I'd be supportive of is moving forward with the city hall, the uh, city hall lift station, the corp yard, and then um, the modified version of the Laguna Beach Community and Recreation Center, as well as any other um, any other facilities that staff and the consultant believe are viable to put out for RFP. Because again, the worst thing that happens is um, we decide to not move forward with one of those facilities, um, and and then I would also support moving forward with the procurement of an owner's representative who can um who can help us through this process i'm frustrated that we don't have a, a sole source policy because i think you could make the findings um if we were at the county you could make the findings for a sole source with optony because they've just did spend all this time and we spent money on this report but i think i really think having an, an owner's representative is going to be very critical to making sure that we get this right and then once we do it once we get it right we can we can replicate it we could do it at the water we could 
do it at the water district as well and bring them in. We could bring South Coast and we could really bring our um, the school district in. So I, I think getting this right is important. And so I believe that having an owner's representative is going to allow us to really leverage the free market to to actually get to make this happen. So that would be um, that'd be what I'm, I'm supportive of. I'm interested to hear what the rest of my colleagues think. Mark. Yeah, I'd like to take a minute and talk about you're looking for directions on the sites, correct? Correct. Site and size. So, yeah, site size. So we quite possibly could be having some changes at the village entrance. And I'm just wondering um, my other colleagues um, thoughts on that. And with the the fleet, um, what what cars or portions of the fleet would be being charged at the city hall location versus the corporate yard? Like police cars, would they be here or up at the corporate yard? Yes. Police, fire, marine safety are all there. Some community development vehicles. Anything there else? meaning at the corporate yard? Pardon me. Here. Corporate yard is public works and trolleys. Okay. So that's my question is how how do we move forward with the uh, the the city hall knowing that there's uh, a very likelihood of um, some big changes happening at the village entrance and we don't know really where the systems would be located i, I asked public I works that i don't think either the lift the city hall lift station or city hall would be affected I by so either. plans i don't think so either did you see the picture yeah i saw the picture but i don't think so Anything's feasible, it would just cost. What's the page? Right. Something's installed, be moved. You would retain the solar panels. You'd have to pay for steel and wire, which is about 50% of your install cost. 18, page 18 and page 17. 17, can you can you talk about page 17 for a minute, the City Hall campus? That's pretty extreme. Page 17 on the staff report? Yeah. To confirm that's you're looking at 18 solar panel locations all throughout mm -hmm. yeah yeah let me pull that up on for the benefit of the the community here Let's see what we're looking i guess at. my question is are we studying something that's practical or even that the community would get behind well what i can ask is what's practical is there's financially there's a benefit and it would provide 100% offset of community or of the uh, the facilities consumption and fleet conversion. Um, I will leave the concept of is that practical to, to consider to be considered by the city council. So what you're saying is that if we did install the system at this uh, city hall that it could be dismantled and we would be able to salvage the solar panels and that's 30 percent of the overall cost uh 40 to 50 40 percent 40 steel and wire it's about 40 percent of the upfront costs you're seeing so could they be moved yes you wouldn't be generating power for two years let's say during construction if there was significant construction uh, and then likely just new steel and wires but just just for clarity it, that's page 17 page page 18 page 18 it was being recommended just those right, locations right. yeah yeah, yeah. it's a lot of those <laughs> this was just to demonstrate the extent mm -hmm. of optinese analysis uh no stone unturned at these locations but you are correct councilmember whalen this is what was ultimately evaluated and recommended well, well i understand your point mark i think it still come back with a proposal and then you know we're a few months down the road and we'll okay evaluate it then i guess yeah and when the proposal comes back jeremy are you going to provide any you know better pictures maybe of what it looks like to bob's point about the visuals that uh you know at the front end of the street side i don't know that people object to that they might praise it but uh we're going to see that more defined in the next stage that we aesthetic is always it, we could include conceptual I, renderings I think, I think that would be helpful 
to give bear with me as I scroll through. I mean, we, we can also ask to contemplate more um, ornate solar structures than your typical. For example, we've included in the report here, you can see there's okay. fancier designed carport systems. Two, I'm sorry, George. Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why we can't include all these locations that you've come up with. And, and then the 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 selection of 24 36 and 48 or 24 12 24 and 36 can be done at the next stage can't they we don't you don't have to have a definitive answer for those right now or do you well yeah they they would drive the specs of the system the batteries oh okay. uh, i think photovoltaic is consistent across the solar panels but your battery system Okay. Is larger. Obviously, a, a 24 versus a 72 hour is a very different size battery system or number of batteries. So I think Bob has mentioned a corporate yard or the uh, perhaps that should be at uh, the three three year city hall or is that city hall, Bob, you mentioned three year? Uh, I was just saying the corp yard really doesn't make sense. It okay. doesn't really change your net present value. And then, um, you know, um, you, you'd leave that at one year, right? So. Well, Corp Yard, I can see going to 72 hour system because it really doesn't impact your net present yeah. value. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how much on these others. I mean, the City Hall, it seems to me, why not opt for more? Um, the lift station to go from 24 to 48 is minimal. Um, and then, um, Alex, were you saying, or, or not to proceed with the Suzy Q. Was somebody? Oh well, I mean, I, I'd be supportive of just including it in the procurement. But if, if, um, yeah, okay, just so included. Um, did we? I mean, in terms of looking at other buildings, I, I you know, animal shelter, worth looking at. Did we look at the FOA uh, or the Playhouse? Because the city owns both those properties. Not as part of this study, no. Because there's a lot of flat roof on the playhouse, and then I think there's a fair amount of flat roof back on the not not on the you wouldn't put them on the you know the we call that stuff you know that's over the, where the artists are, but in the back lot where you've got the um, the, the the workshops and things like yeah. that, there's quite a quite a bit of flat roof over there too. Might be worth looking at. We get enough. So the pageant last year, we had a power outage and they lost a whole they lost a whole day of revenue. Could we get enough power to run the pageant from this one of these systems? Six we, weeks. We'd just have to look at the productivity of sunlight in the location, trees. Yeah, that's. I know there's a lot of trees around there. But you just, yeah, that's stage one feasibility. What's the productive hours of sunlight? What's its use? And then you run the math equation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can well, I ask can a we, question? Can we look at? I mean, can, <clears throat> can we ask that the you look at the playhouse and the festival as part of this, or sure to include as next as part of the RFP, include yeah. them for feasibility and design build. Assuming install. that that the procurement consultant thinks it's viable. Yeah. Right. I mean, so right, we I do guess, a little bit of whatever phase one is, yeah. but. Yeah, they are city-owned properties. They're right here. Sue's Point's a good one. They lost a whole day of operations over there just from a. Mm. Um, yeah, if that's the the council's direction. We could certainly start preparing that and include it in this as part and parcel with this, or bring a list back for the council to review to start the next phase of feasibility. Um, that's it's all manageable. So, you know, I'm I'm thinking like we should focus on where our, our biggest vulnerabilities are. And I think, well, for one thing, we want to do the corp yard because we want to do the electrification, but I think we should be looking at the lift stations because, you know, we start losing, we can lose one lift station and have a disaster yeah. as we found out. So I think we should, we have to, what, we have tw 25 lift stations? <laughs> Something like that. This sewer system keeps keeps on giving. So, so going back to my other, I, I'm just trying to figure out a way forward on this procurement thing. So could we authorize hypothetically the city, because the city manager can execute contracts that are under $75,000 without an RFP. 
right? So could we authorize the city manager to execute a, a owner's manager uh, or owner's representative solar procurement contract up to the city manager's authority? And then if not, if, if, could it, um, then go out for RFP, would that work? So hypothetically, if, if Optini reduced their proposal so that it was under. Alternatively, we could get a sole source. No, we're not allowed to. We, I thought we could, though. For what site? Are you like the lift station? No, we're talking about the owner's representative. Owner's representative. For the procurement. Okay. <laughs> like at the county, we'd be able to make findings if... for, <laughs> but I don't think we can here. I think <clears throat> there's not a lot of flexibility as our code is currently written. And so... I think the going up to 75 and then going to an RFP, if if we can achieve it at 75, maybe. That seems like the best the best option. I we don't know. We financially that probably wouldn't work out. I've asked that and had that conversation. It doesn't necessarily scale that way. If the council desires a purchase rep or a buyer's rep, what about this? We initiate an RFP. And we come back during the May workshop with uh, results from that and what that cost will be for ever, the information we've received tonight. The council could consider at that time we can include it in the budget and we can award a contract that doesn't have limitations like that. So, so we delay the project by two months, run through an RFP, and then we have our buyer's agent and we can do everything we're suggesting tonight. But what's the downside of doing a time and materials contract? If we can't do it, then we do the RFP. But I'm not sure that we can get a time and materials contract from Optini for seventy five thousand. For seventy five thousand, I don't know if their business scales that way. Okay. Sorry, I think he raised his hand, Jonathan. Sure, you're happy to respond to that if, if it's okay. I think that um, the way that we presented our, our quick proposal was based upon several tasks. And so uh, we could break an RFP management, uh, procurement management into multiple tasks uh, to be able to uh, put together an RFP and to, um, I think was task one, and then go through the actual RFP evaluation, evaluation of proposals and proposers. Um, analyze financial, uh, fi you know, pre prepare financial findings and basically get through to um, get through to a decision as a task two. And then a task three would be um, supporting contract negotiation. So if there were some breakup of yeah. those three tasks that that would make things easier for the city, we're, we're happy to be flexible. Okay. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to propose is that we, uh, we direct staff to, uh, to enter a, a contract with Optini for task one and task two, which I believe are, are, um, are the developing the RFP. And then number two is, um, I think helping with like the scoring and the analysis that would be under $75,000. So that's, that's what I'd be supportive of. And then moving forward with, an, cause that way we don't have to wait till May to move forward the RFP. And then I'd be supportive of moving forward with, um, with all of these sites, plus any additional sites that staff and the consultant or and our or our buyer's representative feel are viable sites that should be considered by the city council. And that way, by our May workshop, uh, the market uh, developers can come in and provide, you know, bid on different th different different sites, and we're going to have an informed um, ability to make look at different options in front of us. I think that's the best uh, solution to move this forward. So <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. Did, Jeremy, you need direction on the, on the one, two or three years for each of these sites. Yes, though? please. Okay. That's member wise. Bob, do you want to make that call? Cause you already did before. So, you mean the 24, 48 and 72? Add that to the motion. So do we, John, and do we have to figure that out now or can that be part of the, the RFP? Does that help to, to give it direction now? It does help to provide the direction, but I I, I know a, a council member had noted, noted that uh, you could do sort of a matrix and look at the three different options for each of the four sites. If we go beyond four sites, it's going to be a, 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 bit, a, a bit burdensome, but um, 
I don't think you necessarily need to have it, but it is helpful to have the direction. The, the, the more specific direction you can give, the better, but not uh, required to have it uh, exact at this point. Okay, so I'd rather keep it more flexible because that way it's going to give us better options and I don't want to take anything. So I'd rather have staff and the and the and our buyer's representative sort of, because they've heard all this. And I don't think any of us have some heart, you know, we're not, no one's ideological and like, oh, 72 or 48, I think we all have, similar goals so what couldn't we just have that staff and the buyer's representative make that decision about how to procure in the way that's going to get us the best um uh best bids yeah i'm fine with that as well i think the other thing we wanted to go over is whether u.s batteries and solar panels and that should be an option in the rfp for all sites uh, not necessarily exclusive but either or both either or, or both yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather not get into making a, because I just, I don't want to create more, um, res, I'd rather get all the options on it. So I think I agree with you, George. Well, they're going to respond to either yeah. way. Or the, the cheaper option will be maybe Chinese panels and more expensive option will be American. We can put a prioritize yeah. with a priority of okay. this type of infrastructure. Yes, we can do all of that. I just want to clarify that, I mean, I guess the, the, the request for the specification is, the tight, tight turnaround between now and, and May. We want to be able to uh, we'll enthusiastically work towards providing all of this information plus the additional direction by May. But there's a lot to work through. I'll, I can provide board advance notice and yeah. we'll do it. Well, it doesn't that's be, my concern. It, I'm just, it doesn't need to be by May, but I'm just, it's better to do it this way because otherwise we'd be in a situation where in May we're going to have to do another cons approve Understood. A contract for uh, owner's representative and then go forward where this way we're going to be able to go forward now and then hopefully, you know, right? Agreed. Okay. And I, I just wanted to make that clarification of my timeline concern. Other than that, everything's possible. Got it. So, so Jeremy, just to be clear, do you think you can do all that by May? I mean, yeah, I don't. That's getting tight. Well, why? What's the magic of May? I mean, other than we all, uh, yeah, want, isn't, I, I, I don't. Think I want it to, have to be the, May. I wanted the figures for your May fourteenth budget workshop. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, you do the best yeah, you can. Yeah, it doesn't the matter. Best you can, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but are we, so are we adding the playhouse and the festival? No, we're we're adding any sites that the consultant, that our buyer's representative, and the city staff think are viable. That's that's my recommendation. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just want to make sure we get something done here. No, but that's but that's what this is doing. Because if we come in and we're trying to design this from the dais, we're not going to get what we want. So I think this is the best way forward to actually get some good bids and um, not not be overly restrictive or adding sites that might not be viable. So any site, Alex? No, any site that would be viable. So if there's a site out there that that they so if they look at the playhouse and they say, look, this is a really viable site for that a solar developer would want to bid on. Then they're going to put it in the RFP. Okay, but are we limiting it to the sites that we've discussed tonight? The no. animal shelter, the playhouse, and the festival. Are we saying that it could be fire station? If if there's a viable site that that will, we're trying to keep it as simple as possible because otherwise we're going to get. Well, it's not. Good. It's getting less simple. Though. Yeah, it's getting, it's less, getting simple. less simple. No, why don't we just throw everything? Why don't we throw the whole facilities master plan? No, but, in there? I know the That's dumping grounds for everything. About. We don't know what to touch. do with. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I want to get stuff done. I yeah. I don't know. I'm. So I think what are you should... saying? You you don't want to add anything to it? Because I I would rather just not add anything. I'm okay with adding the the playhouse and the the festival if they think if they're, they're viable. Right okay. Right. And the animal shelter if and the animal shelter. Okay, I'll leave it at that then. I think we can leave it at that. But maybe staff can come back with you know some thoughts on the lift stations. Not not bids. Not yeah. include them in the package yeah. now, but. Future. I mean, do we how have we a particularly should, bad how, actor okay. the station? That's how we should I, be thinking about like it. Bluebird. Frank and I are already coming up with ideas. We're already working. So I'll second that motion. And Marie, do you, do you, do you know what we're, do we have to repeat it? or? Do I think the motion was to do, or did you, did you write it down? No, I need clarification on the motion. I don't even know what we're voting. Okay. I think we said to move to recommended action on these six items including the option of uh, providing U.S. and uh, based built solar panels and and uh, battery power and to go to, I guess, really all the options here, all the four options for the three options for each of the sites, uh, bring those back in a matrix form 
Um, and that's that's pretty much it. I I thought that we were gonna. No, that's not what and I add the other. Th we're adding the two other sites as as study sites. Three of them. So we have USA panels. Direct CM to retain optony for a cost not to exceed seventy five thousand for buyers to serve as a buyer's agents for task one and two, preparing RFPs for the sites contemplated in the microgrid resiliency plan, plus looking at lift stations, the playhouse, and the animal shelter. If viable. If viable. If viable. And we're not saying just we're looking at all types of batteries, correct? That'll be part of the analysis. Microgrid, right? No, I mean, and like if, if other, oh, yeah, yeah. we're not yes. restricting. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. With a preference for, but yeah, not of course. Excluded. But we're not, we don't want to tie our hands behind our backs and, and not being, yeah. Okay. So I would so I would second if if that, is that your motion, George? What Jeremy just yeah, said? that's my okay, motion. I'll second it. So we're not limiting it to American at this point, right? Okay, all right, got it. Plus the fleet contract award for ICF. Yes. The world's messiest motion. Okay. Well, we got six recommended actions. Yeah. Let's let's clarify. We get yep. six recommended actions. We're adding a seventh one to do a. Contract up to seventy five thousand with Authony, right? Yeah. And we're directing staff to look at playhouse, festival, animal shelter, and determine which of those may be viable. And we're asking staff to come back with not bids, but just a recommendation on lift stations. Yep. Like that's correct, a, right? I'll second that. Yeah. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to get started here for item 13, which is the Artist Whip Live Work Ad Hoc Committee presentation and recommendations uh, from Council Member uh, Orgill and Mayor Pro Tem uh, uh, Renagi. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Jennifer Savage, Housing Program Coordinator. Uh, last year, the City Council established the Artist Work Live Ad Hoc Committee, and at the outset, they established three primary objectives. Those objectives were to establish a funding mechanism to increase Artist Work Live housing, uh, facilitate amnesty for unpermitted units, and find artist shared workspace on city property. The committee undertook uh, a large amount of research uh, specifically to provide uh, find solutions to those objectives, including solutions that were implemented by other jurisdictions and organizations. And their research was informed by the 2019 Arts Market Study, uh, specifically keen off some uh, objective or findings from that study in that half of the respondents needed affordable housing for artists, a third desired affordable shared artist space, and a third of the respondents desired private artist space. For the first objective, uh, the funding mechanism, the committee found that the Community Land Trust would have the greatest impact for the city of Laguna Beach. Uh, their considerations in finding this included that the Community Land Trust could maintain affordable housing in perpetuity, utilize donations, not only monetary, but also real property, take those, those resources and blend housing units into the fabric of Laguna Beach, and focus on artists. They'd also be able to, through the community land trust, focused on seniors and the local workforce. A Little bit more on the community land trust. It is a nonprofit organization. It would acquire and hold land in perpetuity. That takes out the land cost for housing, which then makes the housing units themselves, whether available for ownership or rental, affordable to those households. A community land trust is nimble enough to acquire multifamily and quickly turn that over into housing units, accept donations, also quickly turning those over into actual housing units. It, the community land trust is also nimble enough to acquire a variety of property types, not only multifamily and single family, but also mixed use and commercial. It essentially puts the money to work faster, bringing housing units online quicker than other mechanisms. The Community Land Trust benefits not only artists, the focus of this ad hoc committee, but also seniors and the local workforce, which the City Council, City Staff, and the Housing and Human Services Committee has recognized uh, as needs in the community. The Community Land Trust emphasizes community involvement, and a key element of that is the board that would eventually be developed. It uh, includes three different uh, community uh, stakeholder groups. In terms of amnesty for unpermitted artist housing units, there's a, an existing program within the building division, although it's not marketed as an amnesty program, there is a process by which a property owner could uh, obtain the services of a building inspector to identify the minimum requirements needed to bring a housing unit up to code, thereby getting uh, the proper permits to make it legal. However, property owners are often hesitant to do that they, they may be scared um, that they would not be able to make those upgrades and then potentially use the rental income, lose the rental income from that unit. Uh, what other cities have done is provide incentives and then a robust marketing program for their amnesty program. And city council should consider council priorities and um, staff workload in moving forward with this. In terms of finding shared artist workspace on city property, we have our community and recreation center. At the rec, there are multiple classrooms that are currently available um, for rent, including if artists would like to use those. One of those classrooms includes a low fire kiln. Some of the considerations include what the arts market study found, um, which include that there's a need for a wide variety of arts, uh, which the classrooms would provide uh, 
but the classrooms don't provide artist space for industrial fabrication or uh, large projects. Side note on the Community Land Trust, uh, the Community Land Trust would provide a mechanism that would enable uh, that, that nonprofit to acquire and hold and provide affordable workspace. Additional recommendations that came from the committee's research was a need to reserve new housing units for artists and also to modify our current artist work live occupancy permit process. Uh, so should the council uh, direct staff to address those, uh, the council could direct staff to uh, pursue a tenant preference policy for reserving housing units and uh, or modifying the artist work live occupancy process and consider that in light of council priorities and staff direction. This evening before you are recommendations that would implement the most effective actions uh, for local artists. Uh, these actions before you um, would provide efforts that would um, enable us to provide opportunities for a public outreach process, as well as off ramps should the city council find a need to pivot from these actions. I want to thank the Artist Work Live Ad Hoc Committee, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Runagi and Councilmember Orgel for their efforts, efforts to work with staff and on the research. This concludes staff presentation and we are available for any questions. Jennifer, questions? Anybody? I don't have any questions, but I can oh. just say, so, you know, Councilmember Orgel, um, he was a big part of the Visit Laguna series from Radical Origins and one of those um, one of those episodes was all about how arts have defined Laguna Beach since it's um, since its inception, and so that really made me appreciate the fact that the absence of any action would would make that would it, it's not going to stay the same. It it means that we're not going to have artists, which is what makes Laguna Beach so unique. Um, so as part of that, I really do appreciate both thanks to Councilmember Orgel's leadership and the leadership of Visit Laguna bringing forward. The two hundred thousand um, dollars to fund um, artist housing in Lagoon Beach, and I also appreciate all the great work that that Jennifer um, and Jeremy did, and Jennifer in particular provided such great analysis for us as we went through this process. Um, so yeah, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Orio. Well, I don't have a lot to say because I'm so anxious just to get the my other council members hopefully we can approve this tonight and move forward and i'm looking forward at getting a um, group of community members to you know participate in um in a nonprofit that will help lead the way with this trust and um, start to actually get some housing created and i'm looking forward to it and we also have the two hundred thousand dollars that the city recently uh put into the uh program as well. So I think we're off to a pretty good start and I'm really excited about it. And thanks for you guys for both of your hard work. You guys have just been amazing to work with. I really appreciate it. A question, who did this artist live work, a presentation in here? Jennifer. Did you guys do it? Yeah. It's really it good. I, I really like, I like what other cities are doing. It's, it's well, it's laid out nicely. It's interesting to read. Good addendum. So anyway, it's a good, it's a very good report. It's a good report. And I just have a couple questions. So on the bottom of page three, where we talk about, it says in parentheses, example given a six member board with two community members at large, two um, CLT residents and two stakeholders. Who would be the stakeholders? Would those be artists? Uh, stakeholders are typically organizational stakeholders. Other uh, CLTs or community land trust use council members or uh, members from housing service organizations. Okay. 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 I think that's it. So, um, question. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Um, I echo the. Um, the good, uh, the great, great report here from our subcommittee and staff. I really did like the um, graphics on the on the report. That was good. Uh, so, one of the recommendations, I guess, recommendation two, and maybe somebody can help help me on this, is to develop a, a tenant preference policy requiring housing development projects to reserve a portion of housing units for artists. And then, as the staff report notes on page six, I guess, 
uh, on February 27, we, you know, took out any on the inclusionary housing, we uh, recommend a removal of an artist set aside. So how do those two square up? It's a good question. Um, I, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think I changed my mind on that one. Um, and I didn't give that input to Jennifer. Uh, Mark, do you have anything on that? I don't. Uh, I mean, my focus has been primarily on the artist uh, housing. So that's I'd, why I. So I'd support removing. This is kind of fun to see how you guys respond to what questions like when staff is trying to struggle. Like, it's great. I, I, I'd, support, enjoyable. I'd support removing uh, action two. Action two. Okay. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we were being consistent. I, would, I wasn't sure, honestly, if it did something different, maybe. Um, and then on the you know, removing of the eliminating the hearing and permit requirements for artist work live, yeah. which I think we put in back in connection with the Longy project when we, you know, qualified eight or designated eight of those units as um, affordable and they all have to be artists. Right. Yeah. So how do you monitor compliance? I mean, if you get a, if you do away with I understand the reason to do away with some of the um, paperwork and so on, but. If you've got an artist work live project, the artists are supposed to live there. So yeah. how do how do we monitor well, compliance? It's so when you look at the the criteria that's in the code, like evidence of a body of work in the last three years, um, or evidence that the artist has formal training in the year. All these things I think are something that staff can decide, um, as opposed to a panel of arts commissioners. That's how we looked at it. Is yeah, why okay. because there's a there's also a practical perspective in that when you're trying to lease a unit, it doesn't it might not coincide with when the hearing is going to be. And yeah, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, kind of eliminating the, I agree with you. I think that's a good suggestion. But for example, if you have a project that is an artist work live project, yeah. let somebody say somebody does 10 units somewhere out in the canyon or somewhere else, Penny doesn't like them all in the canyon. So South Laguna, um, huh. we, we would expect those to be art. And if the owner of the properties wasn't renting them to artists, we could, could we do code enforcement? Would we, I mean, that, that would be a condition of their approval, right? That, okay. So we have a, we have a mechanism to enforce that. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer, what is the, and I can't find in here, but I make it, I made a note when I was reading it is um, what is the grant situation for federal and state funds? It'd be likely we could get some funding. Uh, in, in this particular effort uh, for the community land trust, a community land trust could pursue grant funding. Um, for this, the direction tonight, there were two sources of funding that the report reviewed. One is 200 grand that the council recently uh, appropriated to the housing fund, and that would be allocated to a consultant or up to 200 grand. And then the second was... Um, a thank you to our tourism marketing district. They've uh, allocated 200 grand to support uh, the the kickoff of initiation initiating artist work live units. And what, one of the other things that I forgot to bring up earlier was I found that whenever we we allocate a certain amount of money for something, the consultant finds a way to make it just under that that amount. So do we need to allocate an amount now, or couldn't we just go out for RFP for consult to help for a, a land trust and then that would come back and then we'd make that that call as it relates to after it went through the housing and human services committee to make that call about whether to move forward you could do that could we do that just hope he doesn't watch this meeting well no because because this way this way we're not saying we're we're not saying it's going to be two hundred thousand. it could be so i may pro tem that the word's already out it's in writing on this report well i'm not saying that i'm going to approve two hundred thousand. So that's what the, what they're getting from the council is that we're not approving that. So, so I'm going to open the public hearing. Okay, Cody, come on up. Um, well, the Housing and Human Services Committee has not yet had an opportunity to review this. I feel they're fully in support of the objective of finding another tool for creating affordable housing. This discussion makes me point out the land trust is in, really intended as a bucket to hold something. We're also working on a housing trust, which is more the vehicle for doing something, if you will. And so as the city is allocating money, I'm not sure which bucket we're, we're going to want it to go in. But um, And 
you know, in terms of the objectives of the land trust, I see some, the idea of acquiring existing um, multifamily is kind of tricky. It's priced $500 to $1,500 a square foot. And I'm not sure how those numbers can work. Um, I think there's a potential of uh, donations with some kind of a tax play. We can, you know, pump up value and somebody could get a big deduction. Um, the 200,000 I was hoping was not for the um, consultant. Um, I, I would hope that, I think the actual, the establishment of the land trust is should be pretty simple and pretty easy. There's a lot of models around. That should not be, you know, I know the report kind of talks in good detail. All those are important steps, but I'm not sure um, th that's gonna be very costly. And part of the problem also is the, a lot of the things set forth for the consultant to do are kind of, well, maybe, maybe not. It's going to be hard to get real substantive things like the electricity. That was bang on and everywhere. Um, uh, so um, on the um, the artists live, I think this is obviously focused on artists, but there's also the concept of work live, which is a way that we can take commercial uh space and repurpose it into residential and work. And I think that's an easy and good way to add housing stock. So I, uh, as we think about this, let's, you know, the artists are an important segment, but also the workforce and so forth. Um, on getting unpermitted units permitted, um, you know, San, uh, uh, San Mateo, 104,000 residents, uh, four units in two years. It, it's it just it's a tough tough go. Um, I think that uh, Laguna Beach should have a wow. should forgive um, uh, fees, encourage it, have a specific structure of how uh, uh, unpermitted units will be allowed to be permitted. So Dennis has a, some real guidelines, but putting a lot of energy into it, I think is is just not going to produce a result. Uh, on the, you know, the report is terrific. The idea is terrific. I urge you to support it. It is another possible tool. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cody. Hi, Ann Kristoff. Um, this is the first I knew that there's two trusts being discussed. Uh, I think we just need one. I mean, why do we have two different trusts with two different, slightly different goals? Um, th the other thing I'm concerned about is your, re your this is, seems to be saying that th these trusts are going to be run by nonprofit organizations. And no? Okay, well, I I'm concerned that it seems to me that the city should be running these trusts because the city is the most stable organization that we have. And if people are going to donate land or donate houses or apartment buildings or whatever, they want to make sure that it is really going to be that way forever. And nonprofit organizations are not as reliably stable. Uh, Joe Thurston created a trust where he put the Girl Scout camp in the Joe Thurston Trust. And he thought his trust people were going to take care of it after he died. Well, after 10 years, they lost interest and they gave the property to the YMCA. And then the YMCA never used it. And all of a sudden, it's a part of the ranch. So that wasn't Joe Thurston's intent. I know that the ranch is handling it very well and, and all that's great, but that wasn't what he, why he set up that trust to do. So I, I urge you to make these trusts some in some kind of permanent form so that, that they are not going to go away or not going to mismanage anything. And, but I really support the concept. I think it's great. And I think we should go forward with it. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll be quick. Um, hi, Penelope Milne, president of Can Do. So 
<clears throat> we really appreciate the thought and care that uh, Council Members Zunagi and Orgill and staff have put into this effort, and we enthusiastically support the Community Land Trust, really looking forward to, you know, seeing seeing that come to fruition. Um, as regards the uh, not legal units, both artist work live, of which there are oh so many, but there's also plenty of other not legal units. When you look at the city's current description of, of you know, like how those might get legalized, Honestly, it's pretty anemic. I'm not surprised at the description that there's been four come forward on in San Mateo, right? Because when you look at it, what the city says is <clears throat> essentially we probably won't take legal action against you if you come forward, but it doesn't say we're not gonna. So not only are you financially responsible for stuff that if you already had money to do it, you probably would have done it, but um, you might get in legal trouble along the way just for asking the question. I mean, you probably won't. So while it's that weak, of course, nobody's going to take advantage of it. So I would suggest that, first of all, the city commits to not like taking legal action against people who come and ask questions much more strongly than they currently do, but also that the city come up with a funding source like zero interest loans or grants that could be repaid, perhaps if those owners commit to have Having those properties be low income rentals ongoing. Um, and that also, I mean, very clearly would be could be a huge addition to meeting our arena, because there are literally hundreds like I'm not to rat out neighbors or anything, but you walk through any neighborhood, there are hundreds of those units, hundreds. We would be so far above our arena if like a quarter of them came forward and were legalized. And of course, this is very important to artists who are, are you know, are living in M1A illegally, right? I mean, they need the protection and they need the financial protection. So um, to finish up, recommendation number three, eliminating the, the um, permit requirement. So um, I think that these things could get sort of tied together pretty neatly. But yeah, there, that permitting requirement was created because the system was being abused. Artists' work lists were just turning into apartments and they were disappearing as housing for artists, which is why the ordinance was rewritten and why that permitting requirement was put in place. Um, the Arts Commission has is working on a proposal <clears throat> to reduce the time delay. The time delay now is because it goes to a committee of volunteers and one four minute hearing you know, it may be weeks before the volunteers can get together to do it. If staff does it, it could be quick, but staff doing it quickly doesn't mean there's no permit. That means that staff can quickly do the review, which is not meant to be a cultural assessment of, is this art, right? But just, do you have a body of work? Have you had this occasion? It's a checklist. Staff could do it and issue a permit. So I think we're, I realized this was written in a way that I didn't so you were, I think we're saying the same thing. You're okay with ministerial approval for the permit as Correct. opposed to a discretionary. Yes. So it's just yeah. where it's the yeah. staff who does it Correct. as opposed and, to. And there is almost no public participation in it now anyway. Yeah. And honestly, what would the public say? It's a factual check. There's no, so you're, right? you're agreeing that. Um, any like, I don't think your art is very artistic. Not no. even when artists are doing the, right. Yeah. It's just, it's a checklist. It is ministerial. You're good with an over the counter process. Absolutely. Okay. It is ridiculous that the permitting committee now has to do hearings that literally are four minutes long. Perfect. Right? We're on the same page. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. So Bring it back to council. Jennifer, would you like to talk about the difference between the two trusts? Yes, thank you. Um, so tonight we're looking at the potential of establishing a community land trust. Uh, key, ter key terms are community and land. And then next month you'll hear a proposal to potentially establish a local housing trust fund. The latter is um, at simplistic terms, uh, a bucket of money. Uh, it does not hold land uh, it does not build projects, but it does have money that it can loan out to projects or developers to do those things. Uh, the former, the community land trust, it's community run to hold land so that any structures on that, whether it's housing or mixed use, remains affordable. So they do use trusts in the words, which I apologize are confusing, but one is land focused and one is funding focused. Thank you. And as far as Anne's um, comments regarding the consistency of uh, not being tethered to the city, 
can you give us some examples that you've um, researched as far as how we can assure that they're not going to be a change in the um, in the uh, each property or whatever that is in the trust over time? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few mechanisms that go into the community land trust. Uh, the examples in our research include the Oakland Community Land Trust or more locally, the Irvine Community Land Trust. Uh, in both of those examples, there are there's a board that's put in place uh, to provide uh, bylaws and policies to meet the goals of that trust, which is affordable housing. Uh, there is a mechanism for those board members, or at least some of those, to consist of local uh, council members, if you will. So there'd always be that oversight um, and that city connection. As a nonprofit, you do have to provide an annual report uh, and identify where your, your funding is going. And so there's a few mechanisms there that would ensure they're um, meeting the goals of affordable housing uh, and, and doing it properly. And also in the bylaws, there can be language in the bylaws that um, gives direction in the event that the something occurs to the trust and it's wound down or something and that it could actually, the city could take control over it. Absolutely. Um, and that really um, highlights the importance of acquiring the the services of a consultant to ensure that our bylaws are solid, um, the legal proper legal documents are recorded, uh, and then we really have a set policy in place uh, to ensure the goals are met. Thank you. I hope that answers Ann's questions, but um, if not, Ann, I'll talk to you about it later. But so the community land trust, I mean, it, it could obviously hold land, hold units. It could also have a loan program. It's to a loan program, right? Um, if it chose to do so. I mean, it's not going to be pro prohibited from doing that. Um, you typically won't see that in a community land trust uh, because the this particular trust is really holding the asset of land. Um, and there, there are some community land trusts that might have loans, but you might see that more from a property that the land trust owns and them providing a funding mechanism for a household to purchase the house on that land. Um, but you typically won't see a community land trust fund a new development project. Well, yeah, I think where I was going with that was, you know, on these amnesty units or trying to get more of these units in. I mean, if the community land trust is separated from the city, right? So if the city is the boogeyman and people don't want to talk to the city about it, the community land trust seems to me might be a vehicle by which they could sort of educate people you know, have somebody with enough expertise or hire somebody with enough expertise to go through the unit and say, yeah, it looks like you're going to need, you know, 50 grand worth of improvements, right? And we might have a loan program. We, the community land trust, might have a loan program to help you with that. And then you go hand in hand to the city and say, you know, that's what I was thinking about. So I may, it, 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 that may be something we could incorporate or, or allow flexibility for. Um, that's a very good point. Thanks. Um, then, uh, so on the, um, the rec center, the community, we're going to be community rec center. Um, we, I really like the idea of trying to activate that for shared artist space, um, down there, the four classrooms that you've identified, I guess there's one. So how how do we go from I think Loca is is already teaching classes down there maybe in a different classroom maybe not one of these four I don't, I don't know if we know that but um, how do we activate these classrooms and why couldn't we for example would they would would they be amenable to um, or adaptable to like a you know a wood shop or something like that. Uh, in terms of activating the space or making the space available, it's available now. Um, what we aren't doing necessarily is marketing that to the arts community. Uh, so we could, um, at council's direction, ask recreation and cultural arts to reach out to the art community and make sure that they're aware of that space availability. Uh, in terms of expanding the type of arts there, uh, we would want to speak with artists that work in those particular um, functions and see if there's a need to modify the building and or bring in equipment. 
um, which, which might be the case. Uh, and uh, if that's so, uh, we could come back and see if there's an opportunity for the city to participate in funding or, or identify where that funding might come from. I think we should engage the, um, and maybe the Arts Commission or, or, or our, our Cultural Arts uh, Director would have some ideas on this. We should engage the Arts Community and say, hey, we've got these three classrooms down there, four classrooms down there. We're, we're willing to, we the city are willing to dedicate them to, um, you know, art workspaces. W what do you think we should do, guys? Give us, you know, give us some recommendations. Jeremy, you want to talk about we so Bob, we did um tour the space and actually we, uh George Dubin went and we had discussed different um options, if you will, um, and what kind of you know space that it could be. And we talked about maker space, which Jeremy, why don't you touch on what that is? I think that's kind of what Bob is talking about when he mentioned woodshop. Yeah, absolutely. Uh thank you, Council Member Orgill. We did. We looked at it. Large fabrication equipment, industrial equipment. Would the CRC be a good site for that? The kind of preliminary feedback is maybe not. There might be a corner that could facilitate, say, sculptures. Uh, but by and large, that's a smaller individual working space, and the city should keep its eyes open for opportunities for a larger industrial space for woodworking and industrial equipment use for maker space. Well, I think, you know, there, it talks about digital here, graphic design, photography labs, that kind of stuff. I mean, we, I guess what I would like to, maybe when we get to the motion is, you know, we, we do need to direct staff to engage with the art, art, art community to stimulate ideas and proposals, mm -hmm. right, from them to us. Yeah. So. I guess the last question I had maybe for Gavin, which, um, I, you know, I, I believe it was in the, one of the budget resolutions we adopted last year, requesting staff to, and this came from something Councilmember Weiss had brought up, you know, requesting staff to basically see if we could um, take the 500,000 or roughly 500,000 of short-term lodging not the new money, but the existing money, and repurpose that, rebudget that for housing. Am I remembering that right? I'm going to go by my memory too. There was two actions. One from the council was to move uh, short-term lodging above units to date. Any new units that came on for short-term lodging, that funding would go into the housing fund. In addition to that... Uh, the council took action that as we put together the budget, we'll make uh, assumptions on property tax. If the property tax comes in above those estimates, the first, uh, that money would go into the housing fund up to 500,000. Everything else would go to the general fund, but there, that above that estimate would then be automatically pushed into the housing fund. So two, two, uh, two items. I do remember that. And maybe that second one is where we ended up. We originally were talking about, because George and I had a back and forth on it, about, you know, reallocating the 500,000, I'm using that as a rough number, not the new short-term lodging money, but the old short-term lodging money that we'd always collected into housing and maybe we did end up I'll, I'll have to look at that resolution again maybe you could circulate that to us but maybe that is where we ended up so it's a, it so it's an ongoing out of property tax okay that was my question thank you okay uh any other discussion okay go ahead yeah okay so i'm i'd move that we direct city manager's office slash housing program coordinator to prepare and issue an RFP for a consultant to lead and facilitate the establishment of Laguna Beach Community mm -hmm. Land Trust. Um, and then I'm amending it to add with a focus on um, expertise to support the legal and organizational policy framework. So um, I'm referencing like the bylaws and the legal framework of it because I don't, I, the other stuff about outreach and all that, I don't, I don't think we need that. Um, and then and have that go through the Housing and Human Services Committee. And then um, direct staff to return to the City Council with an ordinance eliminating the discretionary hearing requirements for artists 
work live occupancy which i think that gets at making it from discretionary to ministerial um and then finally sunset the artist work live ad hoc committee and then direct staff to engage with the arts community on the utilization of space at the Lagoon Beach Community and Recreation Center. I'll second that. So just a question. So you're not appropriating now? You're not going to appropriate the funds now? Okay, good. I got it. Okay. Is it, you okay with the motion, Bob? Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks so much, Jennifer. That was great. Great report. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's good. Okay, we just have one quick item. This is item number 14, and this is consideration of possible adjustment to campaign contribution limits. Um, before before the council starts considering this one, I talked with the city attorney a little bit about it. Um, uh, there's not a legal conflict. There's no Fair Political Practices Act issue here, as I understand it from the city attorney. Um, but because you know I'm a potential candidate, not actual, but potential candidate uh, in the 2024 election, I think I should not participate in this deliberation because it could be construed as, you know, self-interest, um, depending on what's done with respect to this issue. So I'm going to recuse myself from, from the vote. And I will do that too. It's good that it's not the, the election year when we have three of us running. <laughs> Or else we'd be we'd have an issue. Three of us will decide what we're going to do here. Okay. So, uh, Mayor, if yeah. you may, go ahead for this item. You have it, to leave. Yeah. <laughs> for this item, it comes before the council every four years to consider, um, because our code is so clunky. The way I drafted the agenda report, the recommendation, I actually am changing that recommendation after discussions with. Gavin on the intent of the ordinance and the city attorney's office. So what I passed out to you is what I'm revising my recommendation to, to meet the intent of the ordinance. And that is, um, I'd like the council to take public testimony, consider the current campaign contribution limit and determine whether the contribution limit for the 2024 election cycle should be adjusted to 520 based on the consumer price index, um, or if that limit should be increased or decreased from that 520. And then once you give that um, direction, direct me, the city clerk, to return to the city council with an ordinance per the city council direction so that our code reflects what the new um, amount is. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's essentially we're sort of rubber stamping what the code right. says is we right. still have to ratify it, but it's not like we're out here like, oh, should we do it this amount, which we hypothetically could do. Correct. But I like if we that. go with what section A of the code is, yes. which is the CPI, then that would get you to that 520. And section E is basically saying you need to review this every four years to confirm that you want it to be that 520 or if you want to increase or decrease it. And a legal question, would we in the future be able to change this as a general law city so that it just automatically, like I know at the county, it automatically adjusts for inflation so that we don't have to do this? Is that something that, that we're allowed to do under our general law city? Yes. So could we provide direction hypothetically to um, going forward, have it just automatically adjust based on CPI so we don't have to be doing this yes i i you certainly can do that there the code in talking to the city clerk we we recommend making some cleanup changes yeah. anyways a lot so, of things in this that don't make sense yeah so we're happy we can do that when if that's the direction of council yeah. to bring those cleanups and to make that that um revision i'd probably also recommend changing to odd numbered years instead of even numbered years so we don't yeah. have this um, which is what the fpc does anyways you know so yeah. there are some changes we could do and we certainly could bring that back when we bring back an updated ordinance um Perfect. It's ready to go. those are my questions okay you have any questions open the public hearing anybody want to comment on this no i'll close the public hearing okay okay so i'd move that we um that we uh, that we determine that that the twenty twenty four 
election cycle should be adjusted that we ratify the the uh changing it to five hundred twenty dollars based on the CPI um for this next you know now and then I'd also like to add a second direction to the um city clerk and city attorney to come back with an ordinance that would allow for um automatic CPI adjustment and then um in odd years in odd years and then I would also like um I think with this new law that that requires that we have to recuse ourselves on items where someone gives us $250 or more I'm hoping that we can have an like an electronic system so it's easier to search for who's given money because otherwise I think it's going to be hard to um so I don't know can we add a third action to have the city clerk come back to us with any options for how we could better track this this information so no one gets into trouble tracking and a system for searching are two different things like when you go to the FEC website you could it's like a it's easy to search you could search um and I'm happy to bring that forward as far as the cost of yeah. what that equipment would be for electronic filing which is basically what it is um tracking I have uh other suggestions that I'll include in that report perfect so that can come back separately yeah that's okay, my that's motion great. Okay, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Aye. it's three zero. Is it really? Like... Thank you, Amory. Thank you. Megan, we have this continuance on uh, appeal A, right? Yes, ma'am. So we just want to open the public hearing. Yep. And yeah. Take comment only on the continuance. Yeah, this is a continuance of an appeal on the art gallery located at 618 South Coast Highway. Anybody have any comments on the continuance? Open the public hearing. Seeing now and close the public hearing. Okay. We are gonna we're gonna ask for a motion to continue, but I believe staff had a new date that they were asking May for the 14. continuance. May 14. May 14. Okay. So we're going to have a, we're going to, we're going to continue this appeal to May 14th, 2024. Okay. So can we take a motion? Yeah. I need yep. a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Appeal number, appeal item B, which is um, 31616 Second Avenue. It's a approval, uh, appeal of approval of design review uh, for uh, 253 square foot addition to an existing two story dwelling, hardscape and landscaping, and radical encroachment permit uh, 221782 for construction and maintenance. Okay, staff report. Good evening, Mayor Kemp and Council members. I'm Daniel Latham, Associate Planner, and the item before you is an appeal of the approval of design review and revocable encroachment permit for a project at 31616 2nd Avenue. The subject property is located in South Laguna at the southwest corner of 2nd Avenue and Santa Rosa Drive and contains a two-story dwelling. The project site is located within the village community zone. The proposed project is a 253 square foot addition to an existing two-story dwelling, hardscaping and landscaping, and a revocable encroachment permit is requested for construction and maintenance of improvements within the 2nd Avenue public right-of-way. The Design Review Board heard this project on November, December 7, 2023, and during the hearing, the board received public testimony expressing concerns related to the porch, the parking space, the landscape plan, the design of the project, privacy, noise, view equity, neighborhood compatibility, the orange tree, and lighting. The board approved the project with a 5-0 vote and added conditions. These are the two conditions on the slide before you. 
One condition was to replace the proposed Oliver twist with the podocarpus hedge at 10 feet in height at the southern portion of the property. Another condition was to replace the proposed Birds of Paradise with Oliver twist at the uh, northern portion of the project site. On the next two slides, I'll be going over staff's responses to the nine points of contention. In response to contention one, no member of the board gave any indication of bias, nor was there any evidence of bias introduced into the record by virtue of curing the Brown Act deficiency at the public meeting. The public had the opportunity to express comments and concerns on the project for the board's consideration for purposes of changes to the project. In fact, the board did make changes to the project that were not addressed during the October public hearing. Overall, the increased public participation shaped and changed the project. Contention number two, existing single family dwellings have a non-conforming number of required parking spaces um, that may be enlarged or expanded without complying with the required number of spaces if the total gross floor area of the residential structure, including the proposed enlargement or addition, does not exceed 1,500 square feet, and at least one parking space is provided on the property. The property is also in conformance with the density requirement allowed by the village community zone, which allows for one primary dwelling unit per parcel. In response to contentions three and six, the board considered comments regarding privacy concerns. During deliberations, board members indicated that the design achieved privacy because the windows in the project did not line up with neighbors' windows and the 10-foot podocarpus hedge at the southern corner of the property addressed the privacy concerns. The board explored keeping the birds of paradise and asked if the orange tree can be preserved. The applicant indicated they would hire an arborist to identify ways to treat the orange tree to give it the best chance at, of survival. In response to contention number four, the structure was constructed in approximately 1933 under county jurisdiction. The structure currently encroaches into the front yard setback area and into the public right of way along 2nd Avenue. The enclosed porch is considered habitable space per Laguna Beach Municipal Code. The proposed project is not a major remodel and a variance is not required to maintain this existing nonconformity. Contention number five, pursuant to Laguna Beach Municipal Code section 2556-008, a legal nonconforming structure may be enlarged or expanded if the enlargement or expand expansion complies with every respect with all applicable provisions of Title 25. Here, the proposed project does not enlarge or expand the front yard setback nonconformity, as the proposed addition is in the rear of the property. Further, the addition in the rear of the property complies with all requirements of Title 25. As mentioned earlier, existing single family dwellings that have nonconforming number of required parking spaces may be enlarged or expanded without complying with the required number of parking spaces if the total gross floor area of the residential, stru residential structure does not exceed 1,500 square feet and at least one parking space is provided on site, which this project does provide. In response to number seven, the staff report for December 7th, 2023 public hearing on this item addressed the revocable encroachment permit, which includes replacing existing hardscaping and stones with new stone steps and hardscaping and irrigation along 2nd Avenue. The design review board reviewed the revocable encroachment permit and asked questions related to the improvements in the right of way at the hearing. Board member Weil mentioned the revocable encroachment permit allows the current and future owners know that those additions would need to be removed if the street is widened. In response to contention number eight, the landscape scenic highways resource document does encourage preservation of existing trees that enhance the scenic character, but the board did not find the preservation of the trees was necessary to enhance the character and stated that the current landscaping has the appearance of randomness and that the proposed landscaping was appropriate for the site. The board commented that some of the trees on the site are visibly in peril and out of context with the house and that the landscape plan would provide attractive landscaping to complement versus covering the house. The landscape plan includes coastal adaptive and native plants that are consistent with the recommendations of the landscape scenic highways resource document. In response to contention nine, the following criteria are met as discussed in the staff report and staff recommends that the city council deny the appeal and sustain the design review board's approval of design review and revocable encroachment permit. With that, staff is available for questions. 
Okay, thank you for the report. Questions for staff? Anybody? No? Okay, how many appellants are here? Two? Okay, come forward. Okay, you each have five minutes. Thank you, Council. Um, next slide. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about these five issues. Next. Um, this is a, where the star is, is the house that uh, is in question. And these are the appellants, John Conti, Ryan Goldsmith, Nathan Bishop, myself, and Barbara Manalise. Unfortunately, both Ryan, Nathan, and Barbara have serious illnesses happening in their family and so can't be here tonight. If I go a little bit over, would you please give me a little slack? Because um, they were going to take part of this presentation. Next. So the the issue of the covered parking is something that um, the staff just raised about the 1,500 square foot limit. That was never told to the design review board. They said that um, the parking spot had been granted as part of the use permit and therefore they could keep it. So originally the house was a single family with a one car garage next. And it was illegally converted to a second residential unit probably before the Ostermeyers bought it next. And the, both the county and the city unsuccessfully tried to uh, abate the uh, illegally made second unit next. But in 1995, he got they got a permission from the city as a result of the Wilson lawsuit um, to, to keep the second unit. And it, part of that approval had to do with this replacement parking spot in the backyard next. So now they want to have a, sec a single family house again, but not put the parking back in the garage that was supposed to be there next. Making a single family house without its garage next. So it seems to us that the city shouldn't be exempting applicants from covered parking requirements just because they used to have a second unit or an ADU. To me, this is a very slippery slope for many of the applications that are coming forward now. And this, this case should be an example that the requirement is that you have a covered parking spot with a, with a single family home. And that's part of the zoning code. Next. So in our view, they should restore the garage. Next. The other next issue is privacy and window placement. On the left is the view from Ryan and Nathan's yard uh, now. And then this on the right is where these windows would be with this project looking right into their private yard space. Next. The board thought that they were addressing that concern by the 10 foot hedge that, that was required, but they didn't ask to see an exhibit of, of where that um, would go to and how it would buffer the privacy. And you can see that the 10 foot height goes to the windowsill of the windows that are in question. Um, board member Gibbs stated that there were no windows on the south side, so there really was no issue for Mr. Conti. But as you can see here, he was mistaken and there are substantial windows on the south side of the house. So he made his decision based on faulty information. Next. The orange tree is shown there on the that green blob above the, the 10 foot hedge. And there's a photograph of it. And you see where the stakes are right in the middle of that orange tree. And so even though they've said they're going to have an arborist, I'm sure they will, um, how to save half a tree when the footings are right up next to the trunk and, and half of the roots are cut away, it's very doubtful. Next. 
the landscape items regarding neighborhood character were never evaluated by the landscape architecture reviewer. This is a picture of his of their um, form. He never fill, filled them out. He didn't say yes or no. Next. But in the staff report, it said the landscape consultant determined that the landscape plan is consistent with the city's neighborhood landscaping recommendations. That was not true. And it misled the board into thinking that that was all taken care of. Next. Now they're saying it didn't indicate any inconsistency, which means they didn't say anything. But, you know, it, it's misleading when you read that. Next. So on the left is what you see today, a, a poorly maintained landscape, but it's a buffer of, of trees and, and it, it shelters the house. With the removal of all the mature trees, it's going to be very stark and it, the landscape setting will be completely removed and the plants that they're putting in are not very substantial. Next. And the walls are coming right up to the edge of pavement, which is something that Kathy Yurka objects to and we object to. The Landscape and Scenic Highways plan talks about rock borders, informal things that people could step off the pavement if they needed to without um, without encountering a wall barrier. Next. So this is the porch before on the left. And then this is the what they was converted to uh, in 2000. And the permit said that they were going to put new glass in existing openings. And you can see that that did not, was not what really happened. Um, and we think that now is the time to get to abate the transgression of that building into the right of way and into the setback. Next. So the, this plan, which which is just a sketch that I did, I'll, I'll hand this out, um, shows key th elements that we'd like to see. Keep the major trees, remove the projecting porch, put the parking back underneath and put the expansion to the north of the orange tree and, and then have a nice patio in the backyard instead of a parking spot. So that's our suggestion. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> Anybody else want to speak on this item? If you do come forward. <clears throat> I get a full three minutes, don't I? <clears throat> I'll give you five minutes. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm John Conti. I'm one of the appellates. And I would like to highlight a few points. Um, for me, I'm directly impacted by the uh, two south-facing windows. One of the windows looks directly into my bedroom, uh, which you can see from the 3D model that Ann showed. Um, the other one looks into my family room. Uh, the proposed hedges uh, being at 10 feet, um, they don't provide us any blockage at all from what's going on in that house. Mr. Gibbs was incorrect about that at the second DRB meeting. Um, those windows significantly impact my sunlight and view of the Pacific Pine to the west and to the, he the hills to the R east. Additionally, it detracts from Ryan and Nate's privacy in their backyard and their bedrooms as well. There's another way for the Ostermeyers, I think, to expand their living space, and that is partially uh, detailed in the plan that Ann showed you. Uh, further, another privacy issue for me is the heat exchanger of the AC unit. Although it's quiet at 58 decibels, it isn't as quiet as my 32 decibel bedroom. So that's 100, effectively 100 times as loud. Even though they propose a sound blanket measuring um, uh, a sound blanket, what measures are there to ensure that that's effective? Some cities such as Santa Monica actually have guidance that acoustic measurements have to be taken at the property line. So why not here in Laguna Beach? Finally, can't we have a variance of some sort to allow that unit to be placed on the Santa Rosa Avenue to the east, which wouldn't impact anyone? Parking. To me, this is, uh, you know, it's people are parking. As Anne, Kathy Urga, and the South Laguna City Civic Association all have said, in a time where the city needs more affordable housing and parking, it's wrongheaded to allow this project uh, to convert and absorb the once garage, now ADU, 
into their single family home without recreating some sort of lost parking. Especially with the questionable history of the garage being converted into an apartment to begin with, let's put the garage back. The porch, the porch needs to comply with the prior setback, and this is in accordance with the first DRB's he hearing back in 2022, where they unanimously recommended that it either be removed or the extension be reduced. Somehow the second DRB meeting didn't discuss that at all. That enclosure, as Anne pointed out, now has been incorporated into a livable space under the auspice that changing windows, weatherproofing, and siding um, that should be allowed. And finally, our neighborhood character. Um, the loss of three mature trees on this, this project, especially the orange tree, would be a terrible loss to our scenic character. The proposal of the wall on 2nd Avenue compromises the character of South Laguna's narrow streets without sidewalks, as well as pedestrian safety, and is frankly a privatization of public space. Please reconsider this project, and thank you all for coming by our house the other day. Thanks. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, anybody else supporting the appellant? Okay, no. Uh, okay, the applicant, come forward. Um, good evening. Thank you to the City Council for their time and attention to our project. Thank you to the city planning staff and the city attorney um, for their thorough reply to the appellants and for their guidance throughout the approvals process. Uh, I'm Christina Ostermeyer. I'm one of the architects in addition with Lance. I didn't get to meet you guys, um, but I am looking forward to this. Um, thank you to the design review board for their individual feedback and consideration of our project. And finally, thank you to Joanne and Bernie for having faith in my sister, Lance, and uh, myself to work through the process of approvals. They're watching at home tonight, and I wanna recognize first and foremost that this project is for them as homeowners of more than 50 years, that ultimately they can spend their retirement years at the house they've loved for more than half a century. Uh, these slides will cover primarily two issues, parking and the revocable encroachment. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, as you read in the city staff report, the project complies with all parking requirements. Per requirements for properties less than 1,500 square feet, there is one uncovered parking space accessible off of Santa Rosa. It has existed since a 1995 agreement with the city. And then next slide, please. The house is a one family house that included a previous agreement to include one rental unit. And if you read this, it says the courts have determined that the city is unable to require additional off-street parking facilities for second units. So this agreement was really having to do with the house uh, as it was built in 1933. And that's why we have one off-street parking. Um, if you can go to the next slide. The reason, oh, sorry. The reason for the revocable encroachment permit is the proposed landscape improvements. As part of the encroachment permit, an existing non-compliant structure is shown on the plans. No work is proposed on the structure. Next, please. As shown on an assessment report prepared by the county, the existing non-conforming structure has existed as habitable space at least since November of 1966. Next, please. The structure was repaired to replace the siding, the windows, and the roofing, but the size and the scale remained the same as seen here in these photos showing the footings in their exact same location. There has been no change and no increase in encroachment. Next, please. The encroachment plans show the proposed landscaping that meets the existing edge of pavement. Next, please. Um, the encroachment was finalized um, via a permit uh, to replace the siding, the windows, and the roofing. The size and the scale remained the same. Next, please. Um, it was brought up that the uh, existing non-conforming structures should perhaps require a variance, but in fact, we're a minor remodel. If you go to the next slide, please. That means that less than 50% of the envelope, the building envelope will be removed. Next, please. 
A variance application is required for existing non-conforming structures in a major remodel. But this project is a minor remodel and therefore a variance application is not actually required. Next, please. Proposed landscape walls as part of the REP will replace existing hardscape walls. In this image, we can see our existing hardscape wall to the left and the appellant's existing hardscape walls to the right. Our hardscape walls will run down 2nd Avenue to address the grade change, just as the appellant's hardscape walls address that same grade change. Next, please. Thank you. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought you had the power. <laughs> um, so the proposed masonry walls, um, Sorry. <laughs> the proposed masonry walls that we see here are on all of the corners of Santa Rosa and um, Second Avenue. We're proposing the same masonry hardscape walls on ours for a consistent approach to the neighborhood. Evening, folks. I just want to wrap up a little bit here and, and kind of summarize some of the issues that um, the appellants have brought up but I'm gonna be as brief as I can be. And we met with each, we met or spoke with each, each of you. Uh, and I really appreciate, you know, the time that you all have put into it. I wanna say additionally, the board put in a lot of time on this. Not only did they meet for the October 22 hearing where we got a very thorough um, trouncing on what we need to do to make this work. And we made it work. It took almost a year to come back and it was completely redone. With all of the issues made, uh, they came out to the site. We had a we had a number of at least two sets of neighborhood meetings, listened to all of the neighbors. Who is not here tonight are some of the neighbors that are really satisfied. Kevin Parks, Dr. Kevin Parks, who lives across Santa Rosa, wrote an email. I, I gave it to Daniel, but, but I was a little bit late getting it to you, but it was also late after the hearing on December 7th. But he was thrilled with the loss of the of the trees that the appellant seems to think we need to keep. Without those trees being removed, their view is is severely you know hampered. Uh, so all of the people on the north side of Santa Rosa are not here tonight, and they're not part of this appeal. But they're not being represented either by the appellant. The appellant wants, I believe, another bite at this apple. They've had plenty of time. All of these things have been re reviewed thoroughly, very thoroughly. I had board members out there with tape measure measuring the heights of the hedges. We had measuring of the heights of the hedges with the neighbors as well, what they should be. Privacy was well reviewed. I appreciate the need for privacy. If, if the privacy was not working, come to us and we'll make the hedge a little taller. But that really wasn't done. Letters were submitted by the appellant the day of the hearing. That's what didn't work about the October hearing not going through. And we had to negate that hearing and come back in December. It was not because the board had not thoroughly reviewed this project. So I think a lot of assertions are just to try to make it sound like things were not done properly, but they were very done properly. The issue of parking, the issue of the encroachment were thoroughly reviewed by staff. I sat with them on numerous occasions well before he had a hearing. This has been going on for a lot of years to try to figure out, is this acceptable by code or not? Our city attorney did an amazing job of reviewing this. So I just hats off to all of you for picking her to, to represent the city because these kind of staff reports are great. They answer all of this for you. Uh, these, these issues are not a problem to be, to be uh, to be part of the approval. So just trying to summarize here. Sorry, folks. Um, so I think that you've been shown ample evidence that the existing house is not being changed in a great way. And it's a minor remodel. We don't want to make it a major remodel. We have no work being done on the second Avenue side of the house. And that's why all of this was, you know, uh, just added to the revocable encroachment permit. 
<clears throat> the board thoroughly visited the site, as I've talked about. They studied the planting. Um, most of the houses remaining, this is a minor remodel. So um, we hope that you carry through and keep the approval. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Anybody else in support of the applicant? Want to speak on this item? Okay. Uh, the uh, appellant, you have two minutes. John says that the neighbor was upset about the dead tree being in front of his view, not the live tree. Um, the letter that was not submitted, that was the letter from me that was sent in to Amber. Amber was out of town. And I sent it to the person that, uh, that uh, the instructions were to send it to. My letter never got to the board, and that's what happened. So it wasn't that we were late. It was that there was a problem with the with what happened at the administration that the board members never got got my letter and that's why the second hearing was scheduled. Basically, this project is not in character with the neighborhood. And we've outlined some things that we think would help to make it fit better, fit with the existing conditions better still give them an addition and and not lose that not create this stark effect that is shown on those drawings that you you've seen and uh, i think this the board had an attitude about south laguna that was they described it as funky, not as rustic and scenic the way we look at it. And I don't think they considered the, the intrusions important. So I think it's important for us to, to, to think about the character of our neighborhood and, and try to do things that will be in character with it. And so those are all the reasons why the alternative plan is better. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Ann. Uh, were there any areas where the applicant and the appellants got together? Was there any compromises reached on anything? I think the compromise was the 10 foot hedge. And I think the board thought that that was a good compromise. Uh -huh. They just didn't realize that the 10 feet didn't accomplish the greening that they envisioned. Because they, what they should have done is asked for, give us an exhibit of what the 10 foot hedge will do. And they didn't do that. They just said it was, it was okay that way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, i close the public hearing. Question for the city attorney. So I think there's two uh, st uh, standards of review before us uh, for the design. All the, uh, the revocable encroachment permit is, is de novo and everything else is um, abuse of discretion. Is that accurate? Correct. And then on the um, the de novo revo revocable encroachment permit, the staff report lays out findings um, on on this, and um, the staff report. What page is that on? I just had it. Um, so, and the staff report makes those findings. Correct. And then beyond uh, beyond that, I think. This is a, a very well-written staff report. I appreciate the work of the deputy city attorney and staff for putting this together because I think it makes our job a lot easier. So um, I, I can make the findings on the um, revocable encroachment permit, and then I don't I don't see an abuse of discretion. I think the staff report and the analysis by the deputy city attorney lays that out pretty clearly. Anybody else? <clears throat> yeah, I guess my issue is this is. This. This house is um, 1932 or so, and then the garage was taken over as a living space illegally and turned into two units. 
And as a result of that, we want to keep the living space as it is and turn it into one unit. I just don't find that okay. I think the, the garage should be put back to where it was if you're going to convert it back to a single unit. Um, yeah, and and I think the also the the overlook to the property that you look in their yards is is the I don't know why the the addition can't be moved to the Santa Rosa side to mitigate that. Um, so those are the two comments I have. Anybody else? Bobby, have anything? Um. Well, I, the only concern I have is, uh, and I know I know the the board did study it and commented on it, but I'm not sure on the privacy. When I went into uh, the appellant John Conti's um, unit, um, and then Lance and I went through in the backyard and we looked at the height of the hedge and the height of the windows. Um, I, you know, it, one of the comments from the uh, one of the members of the DRB was that the windows don't align, but the the one and the seems to me that two of the windows align almost perfectly and uh, the doors don't don't align quite as as much but uh, out of John's bedroom that corner window it just boom is right there and so I it looks to me like it's totally aligned uh, and I don't I, I don't see that the 10 feet is going to really create much privacy in that window so I've, in Lance's comments he talked about, you know, whether the hedge could be higher than 10 feet, I might be interested in hearing from John, whether he, was that something he would want um, uh, to uh, perhaps mitigate that, the, the impact of that corner window there. Okay, I'll, to. John, you want to come up? I'll open the public hearing. I mean, if it's, I mean, again, if it's modeled and you can actually get a sense of it, uh, I liked Nate's proposal that that actually modeled the building so you could actually see the windows and see where they would be. And I would think that having a hedge, you know, up so that you can cover the windows to afford some privacy would be a solution. But okay. again, as it stands now, I don't know what that looks like. 10 feet isn't sufficient. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if staff has any thoughts or, I mean, I, I, I think they're, I think raising the height of the hedge would, would certainly help on that privacy issue on the corner. I think it's something we ought to do. I don't quite know how we craft it. I mean, you want it to provide privacy. I don't know if you have a thought, Lance, you had your hand up there. Yeah, Public hearing. You could craft it where you say typical eye level. I think John and I are probably fairly close is about five feet off the ground. If you could simply state that the hedge is at least five, five and a half feet off of his floor, then that's your measurement. Then you could you could have it based on his window, which is what you need to have is privacy. Isn't it second story though? Both both floors are fairly similar, I believe, from you know ours is probably lower, I think. No. Maybe it's a little bit higher. So, but we're we're in a dining room and and a kitchen. We're not in a regular, you know, room where people are viewing out all the time. Uh, I just don't I don't see that as being a problem as far as the hedge. But you know, it's up to you. <clears throat> I mean, is the hedge the only landscape <laughs> solution? What about a tree or something? And also, can you? Is there another place to put the air conditioner? Um, it really doesn't work to put it in a bed. I don't think it's going to work better in any other place. It now has a 40 decibel without any soundproofing from the manufacturer at that distance away from it, which is the property line. At both property lines, you know, both neighbors would have 40. With the sound blanketing, I think it's going to come down to at least 25 or 30. It's going to be probably the sound of like the hum of a, of a dishwasher. They're very, very quiet at that distance. And then is it going to be, it's going to be under the... And it's under the deck 
and the deck is kind of done to not an exposed deck, but it's got a front and a side. So it's completely enclosed as well. It's a standalone condenser. It's not a, it's, it's not an air pump. conditioner. It's a heat it's pump. A heat, so heat it does pump. both. It's not allowed on the Santa Rosa side, as was stated, it would, it would need a variance. What about the landscape solution for privacy? It sounds like Anne and the other appellant were um, shaking their head that the five and a half feet wouldn't cure the uh, privacy issue. Five and a half. The hedge height? No, that it's 10 feet. Oh, 10 feet. Okay. Yeah. I thought you said you were. Oh, no, no. I'm talking about if I'm standing in his, his floor is up above the ground. Okay. I got it. And so if you went to five feet from there, you might raise that hedge another six inches or a foot or something. We went out there and measured it with the design review board and actually went up 10 feet. And it really looked like it was, you know, high enough. You don't have to cover an entire window for it to be privacy, but it's up high enough so that somebody can't look at each other. Go ahead. Yeah. I also, uh, we met with Ryan and Nathan, the other appellants personally, to go onto their property with a tape measure. And we measured the height of the hedge that they wanted. So the five of us stood in their backyard and identified that they wanted a 10 foot hedge for privacy. So yeah, it's, it's a, like we did have the conversation in person with a tape measure with them. Okay, I'll close the public hearing then. That's fine, thank you. So this is where I am. I mean, I'm, I think, um, did Jane write this? Yeah, she did an excellent job. Um, so I, I agree with Alex. Um, I think we should put the 10 foot hedge or whatever it takes to cover that. Um, other than that, I don't see any abuse of discretion here. To be clear, that's what the, the, you're saying that you agree with it because the, the design review board did the 10 foot hedge, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Would it work to say? I mean, I think what Lance is saying is you already got the 10 foot, but you do we high, you, you, you go to the end of the appellant's house mm -hmm. and then from his floor, it would be an additional five, five feet, feet, right? So I think that's what you're saying. Um, why don't we just word it that way? Okay, that's good. So, is that a motion, or do you have anything, Mark? Well, that would be that'd be a motion then to deny the appeal. But as option one states, we'd modify it by imposing more restrictive conditions, and the more restrictive condition would be a, a hedge that uh, in the on the back property line that uh, was between fifteen and sixteen feet, whatever is necessary to. Okay. Okay. So, Bob, is that a, okay? Wait a minute, Ann. So we're trying to talk. I'm trying to talk to the council here. Is that a is that a motion? That you're making? Well, Lance says it's not going to get that high. Maybe I, maybe Lance could come up. I misunderstood. Could you come up to the mic, please? Could he open? Yeah, it's, it's it's not just the back property line side as well. That's where Nathan and Ryan are. I don't think Nathan and Ryan have an issue from what I'm hearing, but no. <clears throat> okay, that's we're... not true. I have a question for Lance. Um, I thought you said five feet up from their John's floor. Yes. So I... their floor may be nine, four feet off the ground or five feet off the ground, whatever it is, they'll be off of our level of gra grade is their floor. And then another five feet is what I'm proposing. And it might end up to be 10 feet, 10 and a half feet. We measured 10 as being adequate, but we would adjust it for what would need to be, you know, from their from their floor level. From their floor level. Yeah. yeah. From their floor level. Yeah. So if I'm standing in your backyard, not right. yours, but the project. Yeah. If I'm standing in your backyard, and how far is it from from the ground to the window what we measured is 10 feet up would be adequate to be about a foot below the top of their window okay and most windows are about six foot eight inches off the ground that's kind of a standard building level what if we said take it to a foot below the top of his window there you go absolutely right. <laughs> okay, <well. clears throat> okay yeah that makes sense that's an easier way 
That was, that's an easier way. Okay, so I would move that we option one, we deny the appeal, sustain the board's decision, and but impose the additional condition that the hedge on the rear property line come up to a foot below the appellant, appellant John Conti's uh, window. Is there a second? Second. And can I, for clarity, you're, and that includes to adopt the draft resolution that has the denial of the appeal. I, I appreciate that the staff report doesn't reference the the resolution, but starting on page, it's attachment seven, starting on page 54 is the resolution of the council denying the appeal and sustaining the DRB's decision. Oh, at, okay. Okay, um, I'll include with, in, the, in my motion, the adoption yeah. of the resolution on page 54 with the additional condition that I just described. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, that's 4 1. Thank you, everybody. Okay, now we have uh, council member items. Anybody have anything? I do, actually. So I have an item. So we have on the design review board, uh, Chris Lawman is undergoing some treatment and she is not going to be available for four to five months. Um, so this leaves four. So we need to get um, we need to get somebody back on there soon. What, what do you want? So, so could we just do an like a temporary alternate till the yeah, end of the year? Yeah, we could. But can we do can we do that? We have term limits. So could we do that? Yes, but we'll have to amend the bylaws um, and I think a resolution, which is fine. We okay. could certainly do that. We can okay. bring that back if there's three votes to support that. Um, that would, and I think the argument is that if someone is termed out, because it's, in, as I understand it, intended to be a small, a short window, oh, right. that it, it doesn't make sense for necessarily someone that's never done DRB before to get up to speed. That's right. Um, so we would exempt out the that person from the term limits requirement um, while they're serving as an alternate in, in the event that a DRB board member is unavailable for medical reasons. Yeah, we have a couple. We have a couple of people who would be willing. I think so. Are there three votes for that to bring it back? Is she asked for a leave of absence? Essentially, is that? Yeah, she she wants she wants to finish her term, but she needs about four to five months. Okay, and her term obviously goes. It's not she's not up in June. Her no. term. Okay. No. Okay, well, so we're just voting to bring it back. Yep. Okay, it's fine with me. Bring it back. Everybody okay? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Yeah. All right, good. So we are adjourned until April 9th at 4 p.m. Thank you.